I'm Greg Cox. I'm honored this year to serve as chairman of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors. And it's my pleasure to kick off this 36th annual San Diego County Economic Roundtable. I want to thank you all for being here and for your attendance today. The Economic Roundtable is the longest running free local economic forecasting event in this region and has grown into a forum for experts to share their thoughts on what the upcoming year is going to bring. Now with all the different prognosticators that are here today, some of them have to be right at the end of the year. <laughs> this year promises to be no different. Here today are economists, industry experts, and business leaders from various sectors. We look forward to hearing what our keynote speaker and panelists think 2020 will hold for the nation and for our local regional economy. Now, I'm not an economist, so I won't offer any predictions or analysis. But I am excited to see so many good things happening in my supervisorial district, which is the south part of this county. We have the Chula Vista Bayfront project moving forward and should get under construction later this year. We've seen the transformation of Imperial Beach with new hotels and great dining opportunities. And again, in my hometown of Chula Vista, we've had a makeover along Third Avenue with breweries and cafes. And I know I could go on and on, but I, I know you want to hear from our panelists and not from me. Before I conclude, we want to thank our partners for planning and hosting today's events and for their efforts to support our region. They include the San Diego Workforce Partnership, the San Diego Union Tribune, Torrey Pines Bank, and finally, the University of San Diego School of Business that is committed to San Diego's future economic growth and innovation, and who obviously are today's hosts. I hope you enjoy this 36th annual business roundtable, economic roundtable, and at this time, I'd like to introduce Luis Cruz, San Diego Union Tribune Community and Public Relations Director for the San Diego Union Tribune for a few words of welcome. Thank you very much, Supervisor Cox. Uh, as Supervisor Cox mentioned, I'm Luis Cruz, the Community and Public Relations Director for the San Diego Union Tribune. I'm glad to see all of you made it. It was a little chilly this morning. Uh, how's everybody doing? <laughs> Did the weather wake you up? <laughs> Certainly gave me a slap in the face when I walked out the door, I'll tell you that much. Um, I want to, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, all the uh, smart folks have to say about the uh, 2020 uh, economy. Uh, we are hearing, obviously, especially after the State of the Union address, you're hearing all kinds of mixed messages, so I'm hoping that you can all clear that up for me today. Uh, this is, uh, um, we're happy, the San Diego Union Tribune is, is happy to be here today. Uh, we are San Diego's oldest business, 151 years old, so we appreciate that and appreciate you for uh, all your support. Uh, I want to thank all of those of you who help us with our coverage and those of you who share your opinions and expertise on our Econometer, which runs every Sunday. And speaking of the Econometer, our real estate and business reporter, Philip Molnar, who is in the audience here, is uh, the one who puts that together. And, um, and, so, and he's actually uh, letting me share the mic here today. He's usually, he's usually the one up here, so thank you for that, Phil. And you can read more about Phil's uh, stories about business and real estate. Um, just one last plug by signing up to our weekly newsletters uh, at sandiegouniontribune.com newsletters. So thank you again for letting us be part of this important discussion, and I hope everyone has a great morning. Thank you. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Peter Kallstrom, President and CEO of the San Diego Workforce Partnership. Peter? Good morning, everybody. What a full house. This is great to, to see the interest and the support of this, this really important event. Now, the supervisor had to leave, but I just want to acknowledge him real quickly because he is terming out, and that's the only downside of term limits, is great leaders like uh, Supervisor Cox uh, have to end their term. But in his time with the county, 
Uh, he's been very closely associated with the Workforce Partnership uh, going back over 20 years. He helped uh, found San Pasquale Academy and so many other accomplishments in our region. And at the Workforce Partnership, he's just been so instrumental in our work. He, he currently serves on our, our policy board, which is made up of the city council, the county supervisors, and the community seat with uh, the United Way. But he's just been a stalwart in our, in our county. And uh, I just want, even though he had to walk out, I just want us all to acknowledge and, and thank County Su um, Supervisor Greg Cox for his leadership in the, in the county. Thank you. So we're going to hear a lot of um, outlook today, which is, is always intriguing and, and uh, debatable because we, all, we don't know what uh, the future will bring. But what I want us to always keep in mind is uh, even if the economy stays strong and unemployment stays low, the you know, 3% unemployment or whatever the figure may be, that still translates into thousands of people out of work and thousands of people who are underemployed, who can't yet achieve their vocational dreams. And so we can never just be too pleased with what seems to be a good economy when a lot of people are still hurting, a lot of people are still suffering and can't get to where they want to be. So keep them in mind because we have to do more. We have to reach everybody so that we don't have 40,000 disconnected or opportunity youth in our region. That's one category that is uh, heavy on our mind every single day. We have to do more. And there's people who are re-entering society from incarceration. We have an enormous homeless population. And we have so many other issues that uh, translate. These are real people who really need our support and our help. So keep that in mind because that's what we're trying to do with the Workforce Partnership every day, what we do in partnership with the regional EDC and, and the Chamber and so many others. And so that's top of mind. These are real people who really need more opportunity. And not, that's not a down note. That's just a reality note because we have to do more and we can do more. And when we lift everybody up to help them achieve their dreams, then we win as, as a society. So now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce and welcome the new Dean of the College of Business, Tim Keene, who is a, another transplant from the Midwest. I come from Minnesota, so it's nice to be from Minnesota this time of year, but from, uh, Tim is from St. Louis and has a distinguished background as a Fortune 500 executive as well as a technology entrepreneur and founded a business school at uh, St. Regis and so many other things. So it's great to have Tim in town, and please join me in welcoming Tim Keene. So welcome to USD, everyone, and, and I want to say thanks to Supervisor Cox and Peter and Luis and Philip, and I, I have to say, Luis, uh, you need to stop whining about the weather. I, I, I just came from Denver. They had six inches of snow. It's 20 degrees there, so this is like paradise to me. So anyway, um, I'd be remiss without saying that uh, we here at the School of Business and USD are so proud to, to welcome you and feel uh, wonderful about this relationship that we've developed with the community. I'll let you know that you'll hear more about in the coming weeks and months that we in the USD School of Business are going to be uh, building a, a uh, a facility right across the way here that's going to double the space of our business school, 120,000 square feet. We, we are referring to it as the Canaus Innovation and Collaboration Ecosystem. Um, some of you may just refer to it as a building, that's okay. But, but that is going to happen over the next couple of years. Uh, we're committed to doing it, and so we're involved with San Diego deeply, and we're committed to the economic growth of the, of the region. So uh, with that, I know I'm standing between you and the smart people. Uh, what I'd like to do is introduce John McGuire, uh, the chief executive officer of the Torrey Pines Bank. John uh, is the founding, a founding officer of the bank, which was launched in 2003. And, and John has had a, a, a long commitment to the YMCA, 25 years as past chairman. He's a native San Diegan. And um, he's also alum of USD. So please welcome John McGuire. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, I, as a native San Diego, I'm not used to this, this kind of cold weather. And I learned today in my car, I have a, a steering wheel heater. And I used it for the first time. It was actually kind of nice. Um, 
I want to thank everybody for being with us today. Um, it's, it's, it's great to see a full house. A um, little bit about Torrey Pines Bank. We did. We started uh, about 17 years ago. We started putting our team together. Uh, we opened our doors May 23rd of 2003 with $20 million in capital. And today we're the eighth largest bank in San Diego. And we couldn't do it without the team of people that we have working for us and our clients. Many of you are here today, and I want to thank you for your business. And for those of, of you who, who don't know or, or, or uh, haven't heard of us, we'd love to get a chance to meet you and, and tell you more about our bank. Um, and before we get started, I, I want to express my sincere appreciation to the University of San Diego, who's a wonderful partner. We're very proud to partner with the university in today's event, but we also are, have the opportunity to partner in other events. And um, as, as, as Dean said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a proud alum. It was, it's, it's been a long time, seen a lot of growth in the school, and, and, and it's, 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 it's a wonderful place. Um, and I'd also like to say thank you to our partners, San Diego Workforce Partnership, the County of San Diego, and the Union Tribune. So I'd like to introduce, uh, where's Dr. Thornburg? He's over there, okay. Um, <laughs> our speaker today is a founder of Beacon Economics. He's a panel member of the National Association of Business Economists Quarterly Outlook and a contributor to monthly economics polls published by Reuters. He serves as chair of the California Chamber of Commerce Economic Advisory Council and is a member of the California Association for Local Economic Development. He's nationally known for forecasting the subprime mortgage market crash that began in 2007 and was one of the few economists on record to predict the global economic recession that followed. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Christopher Thornburg. Thank you very much. Wow. Wow. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this is exciting. You know, I, I've done this event a number of years in this location with Torrey Pines Bank, and, and in fact, uh, we have a great partnership with Western Alliance all the way around. Um, I will tell you, this is the first year we're interacting with the uh, San Diego Economic Roundtable, and obviously, uh, it has expanded the audience tremendously from past years, which is very exciting. Uh, coming to an event like this gets me to meet lots of new friends, but I also get to spend some time with some old friends, such as Ray Major and, and Ryan Ratcliffe. Uh, uh, Ryan, of course, is right here. He and I, you worked together back at UCLA many, many years ago. And I will tell you also, this is the first time I've given this talk where I actually have a, a panel of experts who are going to come up here and critique everything I say for the next hour, which is a little bit nerve-wracking, to say the very least. Um, obviously, we're here to, to uh, meet the new dean, Tim. It's, it's great to have you here. Uh, uh, St. Louis, I believe, right? Is that, where is he? Did he leave, too? Yeah, oh, there. I don't know. St. Louis, I don't know. That's in Kansas, too? Is that right? Anyway, um, <laughs> I forget. Um, anyway, uh, we got a lot to talk about. I'm just going to dive right in, to say the very least. By the way, I tell you, if I'm walking a little funny, it's because I'm walking a little funny. Uh, two days ago, I woke up with a headache. Yesterday, I woke up with a neck ache. Today, it's lower back. Tomorrow, will be knees. The day after, will be feet. And then I'll be dead or something. But we'll figure it out. <laughs> Uh, it is now, of course, the Year of the Rat. Uh, as you know, 2020, we just passed the Lunar New Year. Uh, year of the Rat, election year, seems appropriate. Not sure why, but it all fits. Um, but looking back, we want to talk about 2019. And of course, you know, I was here a year ago talking about the economy. And, and it's funny because uh, I want to relabel 2019 the Year of the Bear, right? Um, it was about a year ago I was here doing the talk for Torrey Pines Bank when really everybody started talking about the end of the expansion. Now, that all started, of course, uh, in 2018. It fell, fell off in the stock market, and suddenly every bear came out and talking about economic slowdowns, recessions, real estate meltdowns, and they were worried about inverted yield curves. They were worried about trade wars. Everybody all year long kept telling us how this expansion was about to come to an end. And, and it's interesting because when you actually look at what happened in, in 2019, the answer was it was a singularly boring year. Really not much happened. Now, I get it. Politically, from a headline perspective, it was a stupendous year. I mean, it was crazy what was going on. But the data on the economy itself, not all that exciting. But the question, of course, is not what happened in 2019. Well, what's going to happen in 2020? Particularly given, of course, the heated election that we know is coming down the pike at us in just a few months away. Well, to start out today, I'm going to take off my, my forecaster hat. I'm going to put on my academic hat just for a second. Because if you want to talk about the chance of a recession this year, you first have to have a little understanding of what a recession is in the first place. 
Now, for those of you who have been to these kind of events before, you may have heard this before. Raise your hand if you've heard this before. Well, I think this expansion is going to come to an end. We're going to have a recession. Why? We're due. <laughs> you've heard that, right? 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 Hey, man, it's the longest expansion ever. This thing's going to come to an end any second now. It's got to. It's got to. After all, it's a business cycle. Now, I have to apologize. Some economists many years ago made a horrible decision to call a recession a business cycle because that makes everybody think that these things happen on a regular basis. That's a complete misinterpretation of what the term business cycle was intended to mean. Look, when they started disentangling, because to be clear, growth is the default mode of any economy. Economies grow, why? Because economies are made up of people trying to get ahead, trying to get ahead for themselves, for their families, for their businesses, whatever the case is. And when you collectively add up the efforts of all those individuals, the economy grows. But economists have observed every once in a while that wonderful system gets thrown into disarray. Suddenly, markets are no longer clearing. People can't find jobs. Businesses can't find clients, so on and so forth. Those periods of times we call recessions. Now, when they started disentangling what happened, what they realized is when you break down what a recession is, you will find there are different periods. There's the initial shock and the entry into the downturn. There's the economic trough. There's the early recovery. There's the late recovery. They said, aha, this looks cyclical. We'll call it a business cycle. But, of course, that in no way, shape, or form is to say that recessions themselves are things that happen on a cyclical basis. There has never been a recession that just happened. It doesn't work that way. Every recession has to have a cause. It has to have a reason. It has to have something that's creating the disequilibrium. Now, when I go back and I talk about the first and last time I made a recession call, that was in August 1st of 2006 when I left the UCLA Anderson forecast. And I still remember my first forecast standing in front of a group of people in downtown LA and I said, hey, guess what? We're going to have a recession. Now, back then, for me, that call was relatively easy. Why? Because the economy, while it felt healthy on the surface back in 2006, was actually a mess. If you looked at what was going on, what was driving growth, it was completely unsustainable. And it all boiled down to that wonderful financial innovation of packaging up subprime credit into asset-backed securities and slicing it off and selling it to unsuspecting investors. You know, to be clear, for anybody who's wondering about this, the two scariest words in financial markets is financial innovation, okay? <laughs> That's code word for how Wall Street is going to screw you next, okay? Keep that in mind. And this was no exception, it was a wonderful tool, and it funneled tr billions if not trillions of dollars into American households, and that in turn created some very large imbalances in our economy. One of them had to do with the housing markets. We know the explosive increase in prices, and then of course eventually the collapse that happened afterwards. But there was also an overbuilding problem because we built way too many homes. And most of all, Americans took 15% appreciation in their homes and free credit to heart, and everybody stopped, said, hey, I don't need to save anymore. And we saw a dangerous diminishment in the savings rates. And that was the scariest thing of all. If Americans start getting ahead of themselves when they pull back suddenly and rebalance their spending with their incomes, well, that's exactly the kind of shock that can create a very large downturn, which is exactly what began to happen in December of 2007, the official beginning of the Great Recession. By the way, that date, December 2007, was very helpfully provided to us by the National Bureau of Economic Research somewhere in December of 2010. Thank you, MBER. We appreciate that wonderful backcast. We were confused whether or not anything bad was going on. Now, of course, put that in mind, why? Why do we date these things? Well, it's helpful from a study standpoint. But also, to be clear, you know, it's funny about that date is, I remember the first half of 2008 being on, on stage with other economists, not debating whether or not we were in a recession, but whether we were even going to have one when we were already in it. And that's, again, because at the beginning of a downturn, you don't often understand that you are in the midst of that particular economic period. It takes a while for that to kind of figure out, oh, we have a real problem here. And that brings me to my second concept, which is a concept of a leading indicator, right? We all hear about leading indicators all the time. What's the point of a leading indicator? Well, remember, it takes a large negative shock to create a recession, and that shock can come from different places. The idea of a leading indicator is some statistic, some number that is kind of a guidepost, a road sign, if you will that tells you that, in fact, there are problems. It isn't necessarily related to the cause of the recession, but it's something to tell you that is exact is happening. Now, when you think about the bearishness that happened through our economy in 2019, and all, of course, was wrapped around that wonderful leading indicator called the stock market, right? 
We know the stock market's an indicator. Every time I pick up the Wall Street Journal, the stock market knows all, sees all, all hail the mighty stock market. So when did the stock market understand we had a big problem on our hands back during the Great Recession? Well, the answer there is September 2008, nine months after the Great Recession began. Far from being the guys who saw it coming, Wall Street seemed to be the last group in the room to understand we actually had a real problem on our hands, which is intriguing since they caused the problem in the first place. So no, stock markets are not leading indicators and we need to stop pretending they are. Now, where are we? Where is the economy in 2020? Are we going to have this recession that everybody keeps telling us about? And the answer is no, we're not. Look, you know, I tell you, the first time I've made a recession call was in 2006. The last time I ever made a recession call was 2006. And I'll tell you why. Go back to this idea. It takes a large negative shock to put this system on, on its edge. What shock? From where? How? Look, if you take a step back and you look at where our economy is, our economy is incredibly solid. This is nothing like 2006. This is an economy that is true Goldilocks. It's not too cold, nothing suggests it's slowing down. It's not too hot, that doesn't look like there's any major imbalances. Consumer spending supported by strong fundamentals. Housing markets are bouncing back. Labor markets are nice and tight. Wages are on the rise. Interest rates are down. Inflation is constrained. Debt markets are very stable. There's not going to be a recession because there's no reason to have a recession. Now I realize that makes me optimistic the October 2019 Wall Street Journal Next Recession Survey, 75% of the economists who contributed to that said we're going to have a recession in the next two years. Now, by the way, the 2018 one said we were going to, 75% of them said we were going to have a recession by the end of 2020. And by the way, the 17 one said by the end of 19, and the 16 one by the end of 18, okay? In other words, the Wall Street Journal Next Recession Survey continues to tell us over and over the next recession is always two years away which is really good news when you think about it, right? <laughs> Again, not a leading indicator, broken clock. It's not when, it's why. If there is no why, there is no when, period. Simple as that. Now, with that good news, particularly for the president and, of course, in his tough re-election bid, there's also some bad news. The economy is not great by any stretch of the imagination. If anything, I would argue the economy is slowing it's showing absolute signs of slowing down. This economy is not as healthy as it was last year or the year before that or the year before that. It's a modest slowdown, but absolutely the economy is slowing down. And what's interesting is it's slowing down despite strong monetary and fiscal stimulus. Now, you know, it's, you heard the message last night, which was basically that Trump policies have come in and rescued a failing economy. Well, no, that's not true either. That's not true either. Quite the opposite. There's plenty of drags. There's slow business investment, trade disruptions, labor shortages. There's the Boeing debacle, low oil prices, weak corporate profits, slow population growth. Not all of these are the administration's policy choices, but some of them are. And in a very real way, while you can say certainly the economy is not going to go into a recession, you would also be hard-pressed to say that the policies being pursued by this current administration are all that good for the U.S. economy. Now, by the way, that is not a wholesale endorsement of the other folks either, because they don't seem to be terribly involved with what I would call economic realities either. Now, looking ahead to 2020, I expect continued growth. There are obviously wild cards. There's an equity bubble in play. We have a brewing uh, international pandemic. Of course, we have commodity markets. We have, the stock market is in a massive bubble right now, no doubt about that. But for me, the scariest thing of all are not the short run. The short run's fine. The short run, this economy is providing the vast majority of Americans with the best standard of living they've ever had. And, and I mean that across the distribution, and we'll come back to that in just a second. But for me, the big scary part of our economy, of our world right now, is political dysfunction. You know, what's amazing to me is as good as the economy is, we have two parties who are ratcheting up the rhetoric of decline and decay. In fact, in so many ways, what you see are parties that are becoming less and less involved with reality and more and more involved with simply finding punchlines that pull well with a radical basis. And by the way, you know, people always ask me, what are your politics? I'm a radical centrist, okay? 
And I see these dangerous trends occurring on both sides of the aisle. Now, two things are coming out of this. First of all, we're ignoring very real long-run problems. Pension reform, entitlement reform, underinvestment in structure, growing wealth inequality. I can talk about any long-run issue that we're completely ignoring that, by the way, in a decade or so is going to become a short-run issue. And we're going to wonder why we're squandering these opportunities. But even more damaging is the idea that our politicians on both sides of the aisle are running around inventing problems that don't exist and coming up with policy solutions for them. And in many ways, those policy solutions are doing more damage than they're doing harm. Exactly why, in part, the economy is slowing down right now. So I am scared. I'm very scared about politics. I'm scared about the long-run health of the economy. But the short run, we're fine. Not quite the message you tend to hear on a day-to-day -day basis. So I got a lot of data to go through. I'm going to buzz through it. Hopefully I'll have some time for some Q&A near the end. Uh, GDP, every economist's favorite number. Where are we at? Well, the fourth quarter of 2019 finally came in a couple percent and was a weird year, literally volatile. The number of individual components were all over the map. If you just kind of break it down and look at annual averages, very clean picture. 2.8% growth in 2017, 25 in 2018, 23 in 2019. A moderately slowing economy, right? Slowing. Now, if you look at the upsides, consumers, consumer spending, nice and steady the last three years, adding almost 2% to growth each year. In 2019, a big slowdown in business investment, but it was offset in part by slowing imports and a little bit more fiscal spending, by a little bump in fiscal spending. But overall, reasonably neutral year, to say the very least. Now, if you want to think about the potential for economic harm, the potential to go into a downturn, pay attention to the consumer. The consumer is two-thirds of the economy. What do you think about this for those of you who are sailors is the consumer is the keel on the U.S. economy. Nice, heavy keel, it'll pine you through all sorts of storms. If you have a very light keel, any kind of turbulence will flip your boat over. Simple as that. Where's our consumer? Well, overall spending has been slowing a bit, but slowing along with GDP growth. Right now, on a year on year basis, consumer spending is growing about 2.5, 2.6%. Nice, steady number. Now, what are people spending money on? You hear it all the time, you pick up the paper, people are living hand to mouth, right? It's tough out there. So what are they spending on? What are those top categories for spending? Well, number one in terms of growth rates, foreign travel. It's so bad out there, I gotta get the hell out, right? <laughs> No, number two is restaurants. Food's so expensive, we have to eat out all the time, you know? <laughs> number three, recreation. Well, I gotta do something to take my mind off my troubles. Look, folks, it's obvious. I understand there are people out there struggling, there always are. But the reality is when you cut down and cut through the numbers, here's, here, things are good. People are having fun. Consumers do have a problem. Have you seen the lines at Disneyland lately? They're awful. People are having fun, and the idea that they're not is silly. Savings rates are back up to 8%. The last time they were high was in the early 1990s. People are tucking money away. Because of low pace of debt accumulation, because of low interest rates, the financial obligation ratio near an all-time low level. These are incredibly solid consumer markets. They can push us through a lot of otherwise problems. As for debt accumulation, 2019 was a slow year. People actually slowed down in terms of the borrowing and the mortgage front, for example. If you look at debt markets in terms of delinquencies, they're really clean, super low delinquency rates across the board. The housing market, when I was here a year ago, everybody was screaming about the housing meltdown. Housing crisis 2.0, but hey, don't worry about it. Just sit back in a year. You could buy that house you had your eye on for 20% less, people. No worries. Woohoo! Amazing, right? Why? Well, I mean, home sales went from five and a half million down to five million. Now, they did slow down, but then again, remember, near the 2018, interest rates went up to about 5%, still not high, but up higher than they had been. Of course, we had a 20% sell-off in the stock market, which takes take a little umph out of things. But those things have faded away. Interest rates are down, stock market's back, and home sales are back up to five and a half million. Home prices slowed down from 6% down to oh, three and a half, four percent 4%. But again, nothing happened. It's all just coming right back. Not a big surprise here. And it was never going to melt down. The fundamentals were never in a position to allow a housing market meltdown. Take, for example, Dodd-Franks and mortgage lending. You know, classic pendulum. 2005, anybody could get a loan. It was way too loose, way too easy. 2010, no one could get a loan. It was way too tight. Now, the silver lining there is that for the last decade, the median credit score for a mortgage borrower has been above 750. 
This is an incredibly clean market. There's been consistent growth of homeowner equity for almost 12, 13 years now. We're back to normal levels of debt to equity that we were at prior to all that nonsense with the, prior to the Great Recession. Nice, steady markets. Housing permits, back in 2005, 2004, over 2 million units per year, vastly more than we needed in, given population growth. The last couple of years, most people are whining about not enough construction. Well, Maybe not enough, maybe the perfect amount. If you look at the number of units for sale for rent in the U.S. economy, well, as a share of the housing stock, it's near an all-time low level. Housing markets that have very clean credit and no excess supply don't melt down. Not complicated. Simple as that. New home sales, believe it or not, 2019 was the best year since 2007 for new home sales, and that's because home ownership rates are starting to drift up. Yes, people are buying homes again, finally, after years of decline. People are buying homes again. Well, how can they? No one can afford a home. Yet again, you've heard this, right? Just listen to the debates. Housing, housing costs. We know it's a problem here in California. It's a problem in the entire United States. I love this, right? Can, can we have some data? Can we have a fact before we have an opinion? That, that would be a good rule, right? <laughs> well, this is a share of owners by housing costs as a percent of income, share of renters by housing costs as a percent of income. This is for the nation overall. And what do you see here? Actually, the share of households spending not very much of their income, less than 20% of their income on housing, that's rising. Households that are housing cost constrained, that's falling. Actually, as of 2018, this is the cheapest housing market in a decade. Not the most expensive, because incomes are rising faster than housing costs. Now, again, don't let that get in way of a good policy platform, anybody, okay? My constituents say they want a $2.5 trillion proposal funded by a wealth tax aiming to add millions of housing units, which we don't need, and a national cap on rent, which we don't need. Again, completely out of tune with reality. That's politics, and it scares me. Now, what caused the market to speed up and then slow down, or slow down and then speed up again? As already noted, interest rates were certainly part of it, up to about 5%, now to 3.5%. Second half, of 2019, an enormous surge in demand for new mortgages. According to the Senior Loan Officer Survey, this is going to be a great year for real estate unless you're trying to buy a house. But for everybody else, it's going to be a very good year. For those in the multifamily space, is the return to home ownership something to be scared of? Absolutely not. History tells us that in the midst of a collapsing housing market, a lot of single family foreclosures end up as single family rentals. No, no, not unusual this time, between 2010 and 2006, this nation added 4 million renters, of which half ended up in single-family rentals. History also tells us that when people start to buy homes again, it's single-family rentals that get sold off first. And from 2016 to 2018, the nation saw 550,000 new multifamily renters and 550,000 fewer single-family renters as those homes are sold off in home ownership. That is the stabilizing equilibrium to keep multifamily nice and steady. And indeed, across the West Coast, multifamily markets look just fine. What's supporting all this is incredibly strong labor markets. We're adding 160, 170,000, 180,000 jobs a month. It has slowed down a bit. How could it not? The unemployment rate in the U.S. economy right now is 3.5%. To put that in context, the job openings rate is 4.3%. There are more job openings in the U.S. than there are people looking for work. It has been like that for two years. Two years, more job openings than people looking for work. And yet, we still have to be subjected to the jobs, jobs, jobs speech. We need jobs. This nation needs jobs. We need more jobs. <laughs> Excuse me. We have lots of jobs. We have too many jobs. We can't fill the jobs we have. We need workers. It's a separate conversation. Well, where are those workers, you might say? They're discouraged. They're not even trying. Actually, U6 unemployment, which includes discouraged workers, almost at a record low level. Almost. Almost back to where we were back in 1999. Well, what about participation rates? Well, for those in their prime working age, actually, 25 to 54, almost back to where they were back in 2004. Almost, not quite, but almost back to normal levels. But of course, you've got to remember, there's another part of this workforce we have to think about, which is the 55 plus. And for those 55 plus working, that participation rate's higher than it's ever been. So remember, the next time you're in a bar and your buddy's sitting there and he starts yelling about the Mexicans and the Chinese stealing our jobs, you say, no, no, I heard Thornburg. Thornburg told me, old people are stealing our jobs. <laughs> it's the boomers, yet again, screwing everything up. 
Get out of the way, boomers. <laughs> no, seriously, but we have, I mean, a good thing, actually, you know, put that to one side. It's a good thing the boomers are working, right? Because <laughs> we have a real problem on our hands. No labor force growth. Despite tight labor markets, all these job opportunities, labor force growth is barely a percent. Why? This is demographics. Boomers are this incredible turning point in demographic history. Every boomer went, was in a family of 12 kids. They all went out and had one kid, which they overparented. <laughs> but now, every time, every time one of those boomers retires, you get one millennial, one, entering the workforce, kicking, screaming, complaining, <laughs> whining, every step of the way. Can't I get another master's degree, mom and dad? No! Get a job! It's going to get worse. Next 20 years, 41 million more Americans, 29 million are going to be 65 plus. There's going to be almost no growth in that prime work age. This is an enormous hole in the U.S. economy we desperately need to fill. And we're not even trying. We're not even talking about it. <sighs> Now, of course, the tight labor markets, why are wages going up? Oh, God, we hear this all the time. Wages are going up. Anybody who cites that number that comes out of the BLS on a monthly basis should immediately turn in their economist license and never pretend to be an economist again in real life or on TV. That number is broken. The survey is messed up. The Atlanta Fed guys do something called a wage tracker, where they clean up the real data, make it tell you the real story. Guess what? Since 2015, for five years, average real wage growth for full-time workers has been running 4%. Median's been running 2%. This is better than the last expansion, almost as good as the late 90s, which, by the way, was a massive tech bubble economy. These are good numbers. From 15 to 18, the greatest pace of earnings increase in the U.S. economy are for people without a high school degree. This tight labor market is offering opportunities like never before. And I know we have a lot of workforce people in the audience. By the way, this is no way, shape, or form means we don't need workforce development. We need it now more than ever. You know, you're doing workforce development when the unemployment rate's 9%, you're pushing it on a string, you're giving people skills to go out in the labor market, which they still can't compete in because they don't have experience like all the laid-off workers. But now, every time you take one of those kids and you give them skills and opportunity and you get them into a career pathway, it works because they are needed. These efforts are so important now more than ever, not just to help those people get on the next step in life, but also to fill this massive hole in the economy. So good work, keep it up. And of course, you know, you'll hear things like, well, maybe that's the case, but earnings have barely grown in 30, 40 years, right? There's data from the, from the census that says, real earnings are exactly the same today for male workers as they were in the early 1970s. I love this. Well, it's from the census, it must be true. Well, no, know your data, okay? This is garbage, people. It's garbage. Does anybody really think people live exactly the same today as they did in 1973? There's been no increase in quality of life? Really? No, of course not. This is busted data. For example, let's take some basic statistics. Life expectancy. Back then, 67. Today, 76. Infant mortality down. Crime rate down. Violent crime rate down. Percent of the population college degrees up. Relative to the early 1970s, we live longer, we live safer, we live healthier, we live smarter. Where is this in the data? It's not. These kind of statistics don't get captured in that data. There's plenty of other problems here. For example, the inflation. Inflation is a huge problem because we have to deal with inflation. You all heard the conspiracy theory, right? Inflation is much worse than they tell us. Inflation is much worse. Actually, inflation is much better than they tell us. Why? I'll tell you why. Because you've got to remember how inflation is created. And it's not as simple as you think. For example, you can say, well, okay, five years ago, a Ford Explorer cost $40,000. Today, it costs $50,000. 25% over five years, ergo 5% inflation for the cost of a Ford Explorer. Not quite. Ford Explorer today is better than it was five years ago. It gets better gas mileage, it's better electronics, it, it lasts longer, it doesn't meet as many brake changes, it has more cup holders. Whatever it is, it's better, right? <laughs> now, the reason that's important is you have to adjust for quality. So what do they do? They've got all sorts of models, and that works great until it doesn't. Because sometimes there's such a spectacular change in technology, you can't possibly capture it. You know, my favorite example is a smartphone. 90% of Americans have a smartphone, 90%. That means everybody except for those under four years old and blind people have a smartphone, okay? <laughs> and as far as I know, even some blind people now have smartphones, okay? 
Now, why is this important? Well, a modern smartphone's been around a little over a decade. Today, if you have a modern smartphone in your pocket, you have unlimited access, unlimited access to entertainment information, communication. You can buy, you can sell, you can bank, you can check, you can borrow, you could do anything. Now, to be clear, we have to inflation adjust. What did a cell phone look like in 1973? Something like that. Hmm. <laughs> can someone quality control? Can you do that for me? Can you figure out the inflation rate? Of course you can. You can't possibly do it. And it matters, you know? Take, for example, the idea of poverty, right? Look, according to the official data, poverty rates haven't changed at all since the 1970s. Almost 15, 16% of the population still lives in poverty. But the kind of idea of what poverty is today relative to 30 years ago is completely different. That yellow line, by the way, that's single moms. The group that has the highest poverty rate in the United States, not a big surprise, single moms. Doesn't surprise me, I got little kids at home. I have a wife, we're fortunate, she didn't have to work, she quit her job. The idea of being a single mom when I have a job, she doesn't have to work, we have two little kids, the idea of being a single mom, that gives me PTSD. That, that, that's gotta be one of the most insanely hard things any human being in the face of the planet could do. We have an obligation to help those families. We do, period. However, I can also say this in the same breath. Being a single mom today is a hell of a lot better than it was 25 years ago. How can I say that out loud? And I got a friend of mine. She raised four kids as a single mom in Chicago. Think of that. If she had to get diapers and food, what did she do? She put her kids on a bus in a snowstorm. Holy shit. What, is, what do they do today? Well, they're on their smartphone. Amazon drops it off, the food and the diapers, on their doorstep the next day at a very good price. So again, we can help those families. We can also acknowledge those families have never had it as good as they do today. We can say those things out loud without our heads exploding unless you live in D.C. <laughs> and that's a problem. That is a real problem. I mean, even the idea of income inequality. The income inequality we use, that we talk about all the time, is income inequality measured before taxes and transfers. And that's kind of important because, hey, Bernie or, or Liz, how are you going to fix income inequality? More taxes and transfers. Well, shouldn't you use a measure of inequality that includes those? Well, if you do, guess what? Inequality's barely budged in 20 years. Now, I'm not saying things are fine, but let's keep in mind it's wealth inequality, not income equality that's the issue here. And it's a separate conversation completely. Now, what about the manufacturing downturn? Well, okay, industrial production down about 2% on a year-on-year -year basis. Manufacturing orders are tailing off just a little bit. How important is this to the U.S. economy? Well, back in 2015 and 16, industrial production was down about 2% on a year-over-year basis. Everyone remembers how bad the recession of 15 and 16 was, right? Anyone? Anyone? Oh, yeah, we didn't have a recession in 15 and 16. No kidding. And that's sort of the idea, right? This really isn't all that important for the U.S. economy, as long as the consumer's healthy, consumer's healthy. Simple as that. Now, why is there a slowdown? Well, I'm going to tell you some of it has to do with trade disruptions. Now, I've been here the last couple of years, and I won't get into them, and I will tell you firsthand, uh, while there are a lot of things the Trump administration does that I do not like, when it came to taking on China, go. Loved it, all right? Look, 20 years ago, uh, China joined the WTO. And every year since then, they've gone out of the way to break every one of the rules. What's the point of having a WTO if you're not going to enforce your own rules? Why would you do that? Well, they're a big economy, so what? You gotta play fair just like everybody else. So yeah, at some point in time, somebody needed to stand up and say enough is enough. Only country in the world could do this was us. We did it, good. Now, I would tell you, maybe we did it for the wrong reasons, but we did it. Now everybody's all petrified, right? How bad is this for our economy? The answer is never gonna be bad for our economy. Why? Well, for one, we're not a very global nation. If you look at imports and exports as a percent of GDP, relatively small compared to most other nations. Equivalently, that becomes even more intense when you start thinking about our relationship with China. Because of their policies, they have deliberately worked to skew a massive trade deficit between our nations. To put that in context, a couple of years ago, 0.75% of our economy went there on a regular basis, 4% of their economy came here. And what they sent to us has much longer supply chains. Who was actually gonna be exposed in the context of a trade war? And by the way, who has real estate problems, and debt problems, and demographic problems, and political problems, and Tibetan problems, and Uyghur problems, and now a coronavirus problem, right? You think they want to trade war with the United States? Not really, okay? And they knew that. And, and so what do they say? Well, first of all, we have to get past this administration. We just have to get through this. What do you do? You trade profits for, 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 uh, for, for volume. So allow the yuan to depreciate by 15%. So for the few categories that actually did see the 25% tariff, of which most didn't, they already got 60% paid back by a cheaper yuan, right? 
was never a big deal for the U.S. economy. It just wasn't. They were going to take it in terms of a profit hit. But to try and score points, they did things. They stopped buying soy. They pulled their money out. They tried various ways to score political points. It, it didn't matter. It was irrelevant. What's amazing about this is, yes, imports from China down, exports to China down, but overall imports and import, exports haven't budged. In fact, they've been steady over the last year. Now, you might say, you know, it's still not great news. They aren't rising anymore. And clearly, there's been some disruptions in our economy as we find new suppliers and all that kind of stuff. It has taken a little bit of an ump. But the answer is a little bit of ump out of the U.S. economy, not much of one. It really hasn't mattered all that much to us. But, of course, don't <laughs> – it's funny. I, I was a trade economist. I studied trade, right? And trade economists, for the most part, get ignored, right? The macro guys get all sorts of cool stuff. The micro guys, the finance guys, the trade guys just get ignored because nothing ever happens. But now something happened in trade. Oh, they got to they gotta say something, right? And so they're running around. I love this. This is a trade economist. Well, the president's tariffs and trade barriers are reducing average real household income by $1,200 this year. Really? <laughs> Can you imagine saying that out loud? I'm just curious. How many stories have you seen about how bad this trade war has been with the United States? Has anybody in this room actually seen anything in your life that looks like a trade war effect? Has, has anybody walked into Costco and looked at the TVs and went, man, those are expensive? <laughs> Have you walked into Walmart and go, I can't believe the price of a pair of jeans? Of course not. It's just, it's just funny. Just make stuff up. And you don't see any sign of inflation. The price of equipment's down. The price of structures is down. There's no major increase in the cost of durable. Non There's no inflation. What are you talking about? There's been no impact at all. And that's true even for California, where overall, you know, yes, exports are flat, but vehicle exports do wine, aircrafts do it, edible fruits and nuts. Well, wait, I thought the farmers were getting crushed. I thought this remote control worked. That's weird. Uh-oh. Houston, we have a problem. Uh-oh, I see. Hang on. Adobe is explaining to me that I need to update my flash. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Adobe. We appreciate that. All right. Anyway, I'm back. So, where are we? Um, farmers, on the brink. And again, it's a, the stories you get are so preposterous. Now, to be clear, we understand where the metrics come from. Two years ago, we sold $15.5 billion, over 28% of the entire soy crop to China. Went to zero the next year. These poor guys must be getting crushed. Time out. Soy is what we call a commodity. It doesn't matter where the hell it's grown, okay? Chinese want soy. They didn't buy it from us. Where did they buy it from? Argentina. The Germans showed up in Argentina. They said, sorry, no more soy. The Chinese bought it. Well, where do we go? You go to the U.S. We lost $15.5 billion of soy exports. Overall, oil, soy sales went from 55 billion to 53 billion. They lost two billion in sales, that's it. And by the way, for the troubles, I got a $4 billion bailout. So the next time you read an article and they go, how can the farmers still support Trump? Now you know. <laughs> oil, there's another thing, might have a war in the Middle East, good. It's interesting. Uh, you know what the problem in oil is? It's too cheap, 50 bucks a barrel. Why? Because we're making 13 million barrels a day. Two and a half times as much in 2008. This, this globe is awash with oil. And indeed, if you look across the slowdown in business investment, by far and away, the number one is in mining. That's the big problem. They're not putting holes in the ground. Man, if you, if you had a war in the Middle East and oil prices were seven, 75 bucks, you'd have a wave of new investment from Texas to North Dakota. You see an explosion in business spending and, and hiring in those areas. In fact, I'm pretty sure it was the Texans who blew up that Iranian general, not Trump. He took credit for it, but they did it, okay? Yeah, they have cruise missiles in Texas. Second Amendment, people. What's wrong with you? The other place they tried to hurt us, commercial real estate. Again, nothing there. They pulled their money out. Didn't matter. American investors just jumped back in. No problem there. Now, there has been a little bit of a slowdown in commercial investment, but again, why? Well, there's been a little increase in office vacancy rates. This, that's called markets working. Now, again, for those in the commercial space, it's not the end of the world. And look at the right-hand side. This is change in vacancy rates and change in rents. You know, what's interesting in the commercial space right now is this is not a vacancy-driven market. It's a demand-driven market. 
And the places you're seeing the greatest rent increases are the places that are no change in vacancy rates because they're just building new buildings. It's such a good economy, that's the new building that gets the, the new people. It's as simple as that. So again, there's no problem here. As for interest rates, well, they've been cut. They've come down over the course of the first year. Part of that, of course, is, is just the bond markets rallying. Part of that is global pressures where everybody's worried about the global economy. And yes, Jerome Powell has gone and cut three times as well. Now, not quite fast enough for the president, okay? If the president had his druthers, the federal funds rate would be somewhere between negative five, negative six percent, I'm thinking right now, something like that. Not that that would cause a bubble or anything. But the real question for me, of course, is not why is the Fed cutting? The wrong answer is they're cutting to save the economy. They're cutting because they shouldn't have tightened in the first place. Look, well, why did they start tightening? They were afraid of inflation. Why were they afraid of inflation? Because of low unemployment. Why does that make sense? It doesn't. I'm amazed. There was a panel in December. They had Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen and luminaries, former heads of the chair, sitting on a panel asking, where's the inflation? And they sat around wringing their hands. They couldn't figure out for the life of them why we don't have inflation with these low unemployment rates. What, what are you talking about? We had low unemployment in 05. There was no inflation. We had low unemployment in 99. There was no inflation. We had no un low unemployment in 89. There was no inflation. The last time we had low unemployment and inflation was in the 1970s. Can we move beyond the 1970s, people? Now, what happened back then? We had a lot of money supply growth. Right now, money supply growth is 4%. If I look at that in a vacuum, maybe worry about deflation. You should be loosening, not tightening, when your target's 2%. It doesn't make any sense. Of course, why is money supply so tight? Because the banks aren't lending, because of Dodd-Frank. You know, banks are incredibly clean, but the pace of lending, 4%, 4.5%, that's really tight because of excessive regulation. There's no reason for it. The banks are about the cleanest balance sheets they've ever had. Now, the lack of money is apparent. How is it apparent? Well, for example, they've had to interject money into the overnight markets numerous times over the course of the last couple of months to stabilize them because there's not enough cash. And then, of course, with short-run rates being high, long-run rates coming down, we had last year the inverted yield curve. Bum, bum, bum. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the concept of the inverted yield curve, when short-run rates are higher than long-run interest rates, that term, inverted yield curve, uh, the reason economists focus on that is because it's a leading indicator. The last nine recessions were preceded by an inverted yield curve. Now, that leads me, of course, to some philosophical questions. These are things that I think about in my off time, things, things that, that interest me, little things I quite quander in my head when I'm not studying the numbers. Does free will truly exist, for example? Um, why is there a D in fridge but not refrigerator? Don't know. Uh, why is Gavin Newsom's here always perfect and Boris Johnson's never is? Again, it's a mystery, a complete mystery to me. Can you ever truly be in the wrong place at the right time? I don't know, right? But one question that doesn't bother me is if the Fed inverts the yield curve and the economy is otherwise fine, will it cause a recession? This one's easy. The answer is no. Look, yes, it is a very good leading indicator, but you've got to understand why it's a leading indicator. We had the Great Recession because our nation was overbuilding, overborrowing, and overspending. We had the inverted yield curve in 06 because the Federal Reserve woke up to the fact that we were overbuilding, overborrowing, and overspending. You see how that works? The inverted yield curve is being driven by the underlying problems that created the recession in the first place. It's not a third-party signal. It's skid marks in the road. Now, if there are skid marks in the road as there are right now, but there's nothing to run into, there is no problem, there's not going to be a problem. It's just skid marks in the road. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Second thing to take away from this, probably even more important, and I want you to think about this, because again, you pick up the paper, what do you read? All hail the mighty Fed. The Fed controls everything. The Fed's saving Trump's economy. The Fed's doing this. The Fed's doing that. Here's the reality, okay? Nine recessions preceded by nine inverted yield curves, which means nine times the Fed tried to prevent a recession and failed. They're not very good breaks, folks. Let's stop giving all this credit to the Federal Reserve that candidly doesn't really exist. Now, there are other problems out there. For example, we know the stock market's in a bubble. You hear signs or whispers of excessive risk-taking in non-bank lending channels, so on and so forth. Doesn't matter. Again, financial markets in a vacuum cannot create recessions. Financial markets can create imbalances in the real world that can create recessions. But without that intermediate step, this is all just noise. We may look back and realize we created a real mess here, but until you start to see the U.S. economy got out of whack, it just doesn't matter. In fact, for me, the only debt that matters 
is the federal debt, which of course is absolutely exploding. And for all the con conversation last night, the one thing that wasn't discussed was the fact that we're gonna borrow a trillion dollars this year in a full employment, solid economy. That's crazy, people. That's crazy. And you gotta remember, we're doing this in the beginnings of the boomer fiscal crisis. For 20 years now, the CBO has been telling us year after year after year after year after year, you can't afford Social Security and Medicare, you have to fix it. 19, 19, whether it's 2030, 2035, there's a problem, it's coming. And what are we doing? We're trying to bring that crisis closer by blowing out the budget now for no reason whatsoever. It's so irresponsible to say the very least. And go the next step. You know, CBO a couple of years ago said, hey, make the US economy grow faster. How do you make it grow faster? Well, you can enact immigration reform to increase the number of workers. Now, we know we are on that particular front. You reform the income tax code the way Reagan and Kennedy did. We didn't reform the income tax code, we cut taxes. And by the way, we got zero economic stimulus for it. Just look at the slowing economy. You could increase Social Security retirement age. Well, the Democrats just took over Congress, want to increase Social Security benefits for the richest group of retirees ever. And of course, last but not least, finally, bipartisan agreement, you could reduce deficits by $4 trillion. No, 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 they can get together and increase deficits by $4 trillion over the next 10 years. So our elected leaders are doing the exact opposite of what our economists are telling them to do. And you know, that's the scariest thing of all right there. Now, a little bit more regionally, um, you got dark colors, you got light colors. These are levels of unemployment on a state-by-state -state basis. What is a higher level of unemployment? Darker colors. Now the key here, of course, is to understand, take a look at two states, Iowa and Arizona. Iowa, one of the lowest unemployment rates in the nation. Arizona, one of the highest. Who is growing faster? Arizona, by a good margin. And that's exactly right. One of the things I want you to do is in this kind of full employment economy is I want you to put away that simple model we have in our hands, which is high unemployment is good, bad, low unemployment is good. High unemployment is bad because workers can't find jobs. Low unemployment is bad because jobs can't find workers. And that's exactly what's going on in Iowa. It's not happening in Arizona. Iowa isn't growing, but they're not growing because of China, they're not growing because of Mexico, they're not growing because of regulations, they're not growing because of the Democrats, they're not growing because of the Republicans, they're not growing because people are moving away. And Arizona is growing because people are moving there. You look at net migration on a state-by-state basis, the solid colors where people are moving to, Nevada, Colorado, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, they're moving away from those places in the Midwest, and yes, they're moving away from California. The idea that labor force generates job growth is not complicated, in fact, it's simplistic, but it's amazing how we forget about it in terms of thinking about the business cycle. Here's a basic graph, you got labor force and payroll growth. The more labor force growth, the more job growth. And you can see the top states for job growth over the last five years are the top states for labor force growth, with one exception, the good state of California. Now, California's doing great. Our share of national personal income never been higher. Our economy is growing faster in terms of output growth than the nation for five, six years now but we're seeing slower job growth, and we're seeing it yet again because of a lack of labor supply. You know, on the right-hand side are a bunch of MSAs. Every single one of these MSAs is at or below record levels of unemployment in the state of California. The lowest unemployment has ever been in the state is 4.7%, it's now 4.1%. San Diego tied at 2.9%. The Inland Empire, the lowest ever before, 4.8, it's now 4. LA, the lowest ever before, 4.7, it's now 4.4. Everywhere you look in the state, one thing becomes apparent, Workers are in short supply. And man, you look at San Diego, a couple of years ago, growing three, three and a half percent. It is now slowed to about 2%, maybe even a little bit more when we get the revisions. Still doing better in the state overall, but nevertheless, the constraints are starting to kick in. Now, there's lots of good signs here, and I don't, I, I don't, we're gonna have a, Ray and, and Ryan are gonna come up and they're gonna tell you all about San Diego and, and they have nothing but good news. I know they do, I see the same thing. Tech employment's doing great. Uh, venture capital deals. You've had uh, three solid quarters of venture capital. Overall number of deals are up. Here's some, some big VC deals in the right hand side. Uh, you know, too simple, Actuus Medical. We're talking, you know, about hundreds of millions of dollars pouring into the area. Hotels, a little softer year compared to last year. But then again, look at these occupancy percents. They're all in the high 70s, low 80s. I mean, that's a full hotel market for the most part. 
you know, the fact that it's slowed down a bit, well, you're at the top. It's hard to get any more in there. Border activity, despite all the, all the mess, is actually doing okay right now. And let's keep in mind that we do have that new NAFTA kind of signed up, which is good news on that particular front. Lots of good stuff. non rent permits are a couple really good year in 2019, near top. I, all over the place, the radio, they're talking about getting this bond and expanding the, the convention center. There are good things happening here, people. And by the way, you live in one of the nicest places on the planet. Congratulations, right? But keep in mind some of this. For example, office vacancy rates are actually going up. And it gets me, that again, that idea about demand versus supply limit. Look at office. So overall, there's been good absorption in the A space, but the B and C space in offices is actually emptying out. You're seeing negative absorption. What's going on? Well, again, it's wonderful to build new buildings and get those employers to move there and bring all their high-paid employees who have a wonderful life, but there's no one left to work in the old building. We have a problem on our hands. Now, of course, this is labor force constraints, and that labor force constraint is by people moving out of the state. Now, keep in mind, you throw the international stuff in, and it breaks even, but nevertheless, basically zero net migration for the last three years. That has led to the lowest, slowest pace of population growth in California history in over 100 years. Slowest. So yeah, we have a real problem. Why are people moving out? The cost of housing. Housing is unaffordable. We have an affordable housing crisis. Sure looks like it. Rents are up. You see home prices are way up. Looks like an affordability crisis, except for it's not. <laughs> except for it's not. Why? Well, let's take, for example, something as simple as median rent as a percent of household income. That's falling across California. It's not going up. Yes, rents are going up. Renter incomes are growing faster. The median cost of buying a house, same sort of thing. The trends are down, not going up. Housing relative to incomes is more affordable. You see, it's not about affordability. It's about supply. Now, housing markets here are nice and stable. Sales are coming back up. Prices have been steady over the course of the last year. But overall, remember that while this is steady, it's going to get hot again because of a lack of supply. You know, how, how, why, how do I mean by supply? Well, take a look at housing units per capita, second lowest in the nation, percent of adults living together, highest in the nation, overcrowded housing, highest in the nation, housing vacancy, lowest in the nation. If you say this is affordability crisis, what you're saying is there's thousands, if not millions of empty units, people just can't afford to move in. There's no empty units to move into. And therefore, every time you have an available unit, it goes to the highest bidder. So the reason affordability looks better is because high-income families are winning and low-income families are having to move out. So it looks better, but it does so on the basis of gentrification. And that's not a good kind of affordability. Now, how do you deal with that? I'll tell you the wrong way of dealing with it is tackling the affordability. Um, but we'll come back to that in a second. How important is this? Well, let's talk about this. Here's job growth from the Great Recession coming to an end, right? If you look at the numbers, the fastest two economies since the Great Recession came to an end are San Jose and San Francisco. Well, it's tech, right? Same thing in San Diego, tech. Tech's driving the show. One problem with that, the third fastest growing economy in the state, the Inland Empire. And I work in the Inland Empire. I, I run a research center out at UC Riverside. It's a fantastic economy, love working out there. Um, they don't have tech, okay? I have, this, I have to have a little heart-to-heart -heart conversation with them. No, a drive through window at Starbucks is not tech, okay? You can't count it. <laughs> love you guys, great economy, not tech, okay? But that gets me to the answer. The reason the Inland Empire in San Francisco is growing so fast is not tech, it's, it's housing. <laughs> Believe it or not, well, the Bay Area still hasn't built enough housing. They've been much better this cycle than they have in the last cycle. They built more housing in 17 and 18 than they did in five and six. San Francisco and San Jose built more housing in the last decade than they did over the previous 20 years. They're growing fast because they built housing. The Inland Empire grew fast because they had an excess supply of housing, which, by the way, is no longer there because of the lack of housing supply. Now, if you look at earnings, again, the numbers are up. I can show you all the different numbers. And, and yes, renter incomes are growing faster than owner incomes in San Diego. Very solid numbers there. And you can see that, that we're talking about a complete lack of permits that really goes back 20 years. 1990 to 2009, almost nothing was built anywhere in Southern California. We caught, started to catch up a little bit since then, but overall, the numbers aren't good. I mean, you're talking in, in San Diego here, you're talking, you know, 10,000 permits uh, uh, a year. That's just not enough. And you put this in context, if you want 2% job growth in San Diego, you need 30, 33,000 jobs a year. You had 8,200 permits last year. What are you going to have? You're going to have four people per house? You can't do that. If you want job growth, 
You gotta have house supply growth. It's as simple as that. Now San Diego's been better than most, right? Certainly better than Orange County and LA. What's interesting is how has how Orange County and LA gotten away with all those years? Well, they relied on the Inland Empire as the ongoing source of, never ending source of housing and, and, uh, and, and people, right? Just pack them in on the 10, the 60, the 51, 91. 18 lane highways, no problem, man. Just bring it, bring it, bring it the people in, right? Of course, the Inland Empire's not building housing now. So now it's getting real. Now there's no longer an unending support. Now what do you do? The answer is you build housing. It's as simple as that. Now it started out good. We had a Yimby takeover. Gavin talked about 3.4 million units. Senate Bill 50, you're gonna have density around transit zones. We got rent control. Hmm, thank you. Not exactly what we needed. Because remember, you know, you say, well, rent control, we've got to help those families who are getting pushed out. Well, actually, you're not. <laughs> because in the end, if you put rent control in a place, builders build less, and you make the supply problem worse, which makes affordability worse for everybody, which gentrifies other people out. So you might take a few low-income families and help them, but you do so only at the cost of pushing other low-income families right out of the state. You're chasing your own tail. You're not moving the needle. A supply, supply, supply. You gotta build it, it's as simple as that. And it hasn't been a good year. Permits are down in San Diego, permits are down in the state. Now this is because of a slowdown, but you gotta, context here, right? If, three, if we're gonna give 3.4 million units, which is a perfectly reasonable number to catch up, you need this many permits per year, okay? So we got a long ways to go. But we're not gonna get there with rent control. We have to have substantial change in terms of how this state does these things. And it all boils down to incentives. You know, it's as simple as this. So look at any city, particularly small cities, 80% of their incomes come from businesses, 80% of their expenses come from their residents. That's kind of a big deal. That's a real imbalance, particularly in a world where, you know, people move all over the place. Any city will tell you only one third of my residents actually work here. They work somewhere else. Now, what's the key here? What's the problem? It's our fiscal system. We force cities to rely on business taxes, but then we turn around and we don't compensate them for the cost of residence. You tell any city manager, you got 10 acres, what do you want? I want retail, I need retail, I need retail. Can't have that, I want commercial. Can't have that. Single family, over 750, because at least that'll break even. Now you need workforce housing. Time out. Every time you make me build an apartment building, that's one more nail in my fiscal coffin. Now, you think of CEQA, you think of permit fees, you think of zoning, these are all manifestations of that underlying financial problem. Gavin. Your cities are struggling. Pension costs, labor costs, infrastructure costs. They don't have money, and so therefore, they don't want housing. You, on the other hand, back in 15 and 13 and 14, you had $80 billion budget. Today, you got a $145 billion budget. $60 billion increase at the state level. What are you doing with that money? How about paying cities to build the infrastructure for those homes? Why are you making cities do it? If you want cities to build housing, you're not going to beat them into it. You're not going to regulate them into it. You have to give them the positive economic incentives to want it. Then let the chips fall where they may. Newport Beach, you want housing? That's up to you. Irvine, you want tons of housing? That's up to you. But give them the positive incentives. That'll move the needle. But we're not doing that. We're just using rent control and trying to whip the cities in the state. And it's not going to move the needle. Now, is it the end of the world? Not for the economy. Because look, in the end, California is going to continue to grow. Who's leaving the state? Low-skilled folks, lower-income folks. High-skilled, high-income folks move here. What's interesting is take a look at compared Arizona, California, Nevada. On the left-hand side is indexed labor force. They're growing labor force 35 40% over the course of two decades. We're at like 13%. Look on the right-hand side. That's real output by state. We're dominating them from an output perspective. We're not growing on the extensive margin. We're growing on the intensive margin. So we'll be fine, the economy's fine, there's gonna be people in the shops, there's gonna be people buying homes, but we put a big sign up the state. You must be this rich to live in this state, otherwise go away. I don't wanna live in that state, I don't. Solution, supply, 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 period, supply. So, add it up, where are we? Things are fine, no recession. Time is gonna to continue to grow, 2%. Labor market's gonna be tight, wages are putting pressure on profits, exports, business investments will be fine, inflation strain, interest rates low, lending strain, debt level safe. Where people wanna move is where you're gonna see growth. And people wanna move here because we live in one of the best places in the world. So, we're fine. No recession, no downturn. You're gonna make money this year, no doubt about it. On the other hand, labor shortages, good luck hiring. Fed, 
who knows? Equity markets, all over the map. Deficit, way too big. The bank lending, too constrained. There are signs of excessive risk taking. These political uncertainties, impeachments, the running battles, these long run critical policy issues remain completely undiscussed. But the worst thing of all, miserabilism. Now, for those of you who know, that's one of my favorite words, miserabilism, the philosophy of pessimism, desperately trying to convince people things are worse than they actually are. It is so damaging. We live in a world where we've never had it so good. And I'm talking from the billionaires to the single moms in poverty. Yes, distributional conversations are worthwhile, but we can also appreciate we all have it better off. We have toys and things available to us that 20 years ago you couldn't even imagine. We should be thrilled. We should be using this opportunity to sit down and tackle true long-run problems. Instead, we're sitting around whining about how tough we have it. Amazing. Biggest group of spoiled brats on the planet. That's what we are. And it's distorting politics. It's distorting everything. We can do better than this. We can. Remember, folks, it's not the number of jobs. It's the number of workers. It's not who pays for health care. It's what we, why we pay more than anybody else. It's not tax levels. It's tax structure. It's not income inequality. It's wealth inequality. It's not funded government liabilities. It's unfunded. It's not business. It's a lack of public investment. It's not inflation. It's slow bank lending. It's not the cost of housing. It's the supply of housing. We live in a world where we're asking all the wrong questions. And if you want to fix the things that need to be fixed, start by asking the right questions. My ask of you over the next year is turn off the weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> Ignore the screaming, preposterous headlines that are going along with this election. Make money, be happy, be healthy, and get the message out. We don't need to do this. We don't. We can do a lot better. Thank you very much. So quickly, uh, from left to right here, we have Sarah Burns, the Director of Research and Evaluation from San Diego Workforce Partnership. Uh, Eduardo Velasquez, the Director of Research from the San Diego Economic Development Corporation. And Ray Major, Chief Economist, Chief Data Analytics Officer as well uh, for SANDAC. So, um, we were just uh, kind of having a laugh during the break of, uh, you know, thinking of all the things we might uh, riff on uh, that uh, Dr. Thornburg started out with there, and we were saying that we could probably go for two days more uh, worth of content here. Uh, so we're going to do our best. But I think um, I'd like to start with uh, Sarah. We were just talking a little bit, and we kind of had two, uh, two things that were sort of an overlap of things we're interested in that, uh, that were coming out of what Chris was saying. Uh, you know, first of which was that one of the... Uh, you know, things, you look at job market numbers in San Diego, it's almost we've never had it so good. In particular, we've seen uh, a lot of job growth recently. Um, tech, and in particular, jobs that have a high uh, educational uh, requirement have been a big part of where job growth uh, and economic growth in San Diego in 2019 has been. So uh, I just want to ask Sarah, and again, anybody who wants to jump in, please do. This is something we all have some feelings about. I um, want to think first just generally about, as we look both to 2020, but also a little bit more medium term, uh, how do we uh, keep the labor force growing and how do we make sure that uh, job growth in San Diego isn't just confined in kind of the, uh, if you are rich enough and well-educated enough to live here, you're welcome, otherwise go find somewhere else that, uh, that Chris was mentioning. Uh, how do we make sure that San Diego uh, kind of has some broad-based growth across the, uh, of the job sectors? So take it away. It's a big question, but I think one of the things that Dr. Thornburg, Thornburg oh man, your name, Chris, said. Go with Chris. <laughs> one of the things Chris said that I really loved was economies are made out of people. And there are opportunities out there, and it's up to us to connect the people with the opportunities. And I see the two major ways that we can think about expanding our labor force and making sure that there's access to that labor force across our economy are first unlocking the labor force that already exists and is sort of lying dormant. Um, and the other one is about helping the people who maybe don't have advanced degrees be meaningfully connected to the workforce. So the first one, there's a couple of ways we can look at that. Um, one of them is childcare. When we look at uh, nationwide, 94% of workers who are working due to childcare, part-time, unwillfully, are women. There are women who choose to not be in labor force and are able to make that choice, and uh, that's wonderful that they're able to, but we have one of the lowest female labor force participations among major cities in the nation. So 
I know people who are home with young children who want to be working and wish they could be working, but the lack of availability of high quality and affordable childcare in our county is keeping them from being able to do that. So we have a workforce out there that, that wants to join our labor force and is being kept from that. So we need to think about how we can solve that problem um, as one, one angle toward that. Another is thinking about those people. So we know about two thirds of our economy doesn't have a bachelor's degree or higher, but about 22% of them have some college and no degree. So how do we reach that population, help them pivot if fish, finishing a degree is something they want to do and they've been kept from doing because of money or maybe started down the wrong path and weren't able to pivot? How do we help them to get to the place where we need them to be to fill the the need in our labor force. And part of that is also looking at our pipeline way earlier, looking at the education system, K-12. How are we exposing students to the world of work and career opportunities at a very young age so that they don't go into college without knowing where they wanna go and stop before they get a degree that can then translate into wages and a productive economy? I can keep going. <laughs> I'm going to go a little bit more. One more thing I guess I want to say about that. One more. Yeah, one more thing. Um, the, other, the other part of that being how do we find opportunities or create opportunities that don't require those advanced degrees that you mentioned. And part of that is creating, creating pathways and access to education for jobs that require maybe an associate degree, maybe a certification of some sort. Um, at the Workforce Partnership, we have an income share agreement program where we are helping people to get certificates in high demand areas that are going to translate quickly after a nine month certificate into a high paying occupation. Um, I'll stop there. So guys, what do you think? Yeah, <clears throat> I think one of the hardest things to do, and I look at this from being an employer as well as being an economist is that um, it's, it's matching the right person to the right job and, and, and the skill set. I mean, there, yes, there are jobs open. I know I have a lot of jobs open in, in, in my group. And in fact, you know, like Sandag has a lot of jobs open. We have an incredibly difficult time, we have an incredibly difficult time finding the right talent to fill those jobs. And I think if <clears throat> that's something that, that definitely needs to be, be looked at is, is how you can match the skill sets, especially when you have unemployment as low as it is right now. Um, you know, you have businesses who are hiring people who may not necessarily be the absolute right fit for the job sometime because they can't find those right workers. So, so in, in a lot of cases, I think, I think coming up with a way to match the jobs is, is probably as important as, as training people for the jobs. Yeah, and just to kind of piggyback off of that, we obviously work with a lot of employers here in the region, and the common thread is that they can't find people fast enough. And so being creative and and innovating in terms of where you source that talent, I think is something that there's uh, a lot of interest in right now, especially. And so uh, we're excited in partnership with the Workforce Partnership and others in the region. Uh, there's a collaborative right now to get employers more directly engaged in that talent sourcing process with uh, education systems here in, in the region. And that's not just the traditional four-year uh, institutions, but also the community colleges and engaging more deeply with high schools to make sure that they're identifying that talent earlier and, and making those connections sooner and presenting what those opportunities are here in the region for, for future workers. Um, and, and truthfully, part of that is gonna require greater engagement with populations that are traditionally underserved in our region. We have a large and fast-growing Hispanic population in San Diego. Uh, but they're dramatically underrepresented in the highest paying jobs uh, in our region and typically those that require advanced degrees or higher education to attain. And so when you look at that pipeline of talent, where those people are coming from, we need to be intentional to tap into the, to the populations that we have here in San Diego because that's where the talent's gonna come from. 
Well, Eduardo, I think I might put you on the spot again here too. I know um, you know a lot of the stuff you're working on in the inclusive growth initiatives is targeted at exactly this. And so, from a self-interested perspective, right, I, I am in the business of uh, creating new labor supply in some sense as a uh, as a college professor. And so, I always uh, like to hear the other end of you know what are the what are the skills you need that you aren't necessarily finding when you're going out and looking here. But there's a lot of exciting stuff I think going on in San Diego about kind of partnerships between industry, universities, community colleges, and also sort of K through 12. So I'm just wondering if you can kind of go a little bit more in that direction. Yeah, and, and so one thing that we're looking at in the, in, in the moment right now is, um, so the fastest growing occupations in San Diego, the ones that we have the most uh, openings for, really are all kind of tied to software engineering. And that, mm -hmm. that's not concentrated just in the tech industry, that actually uh, per, it kind of extends and exists in a lot of different industry all the way into the arts. And so recognizing that that's what's in demand and that's what employers need, how do we better fill that pipeline here locally? Because we are having a hard time attracting talent from out of the region to fill those jobs uh, in an immediate sense. Um, so, so there's a, a collaborative of, of employers that all have this shared need for, for software talent, software engineering talent, and what they're doing is being very clear in a way that they haven't been, frankly, in the past about what exactly is it that they need from a skills perspective. What does it take to enter the door and be able to contribute in that um, in that job immediately? And so they're they're putting their heads together and, and trying to trim the fat in terms of what they're what they're posting in their job postings, what they're asking for on paper, and make sure that they're articulating and communicating to not just the educators but to prospective employees what it really takes to, to come into this uh, occupation and hit the ground running. And on the flip side, we have the educational institutions and the community colleges all kind of par partnering together to make sure that their curriculum, the training is on par with what those employer needs are. And so there's a lot of excitement and a lot of momentum, I think, right now in the region to build those bridges and, and create that better alignment between education providers, uh, the trainers of our workforce, and then the employers that are ultimately gonna hire them. I think one thing, um, I, I, I am a big fan of this quote as an educator, and I think Ray and I were talking a little bit about this too, one of the other kind of, I don't know, a different dimension of software engineering, I think in some sense, is the one of those skills that's going to be absolutely uh, necessary 21st uh, century across the, is we are awash in data and we are lacking people who know what to do with it. So um, that's one of the things that uh, I know Sandag's making a big effort on that on your end to, we sit atop a mass of data and we want to make better, um, you know, provide, provide a better information framework for uh, uh, making regional policy decisions on the basis <coughs> of that data. I know that's something we're spending a lot of time here at USD trying to create that mindset in our students that uh, I think, as Chris was saying, you know, let's let's have some facts before you have an opinion. Um, so I, I'm glad to see that that's kind of bubbling through at a lot of uh, different uh, uh, levels as well. So I think one of the other things, again, sort of starting with uh, with the idea of the uh, the sixty four thousand dollar question for California as a general uh, and San Diego in particular, as you start to think about not necessarily for a year out, but maybe for five, ten, twenty years out, is kind of this Gordian knot that we have of we're not building housing. Um, where the most affordable housing is, is at the other end of the county from where the jobs are being created. You know, you need to commute from, uh, so we're adding more vehicle miles. That's gonna undermine some of the, uh, the county level stuff that we're trying to do on uh, climate goals and whatnot. So I think I have to, uh, to toss this one to Ray first. Um, what do you see as the, uh, the, the, the way to kind of cut through that? Where should we, where should we start uh, making some progress on that? Sure. Um if there's one takeaway that you can take away from Dr. Thorn Thornburg's um, just presentation, one? just one out of the hundreds of things that we could have taken away, um, was the supply, supply, supply of housing is, is really the answer to the problem. Um, when we take a look at, and he showed a graph of, of the number of housing units that were, were, were being produced. In San Diego, we need to build about 12,000 units a year just to keep up with natural increase um, in our population. Uh, this year, it's a great economy. We should be building a lot of housing. We're building less than 10,000 units. Our deficit right now, in terms of housing since the, the Great Recession, is about 60,000 units. When you add into that the houses that have been taken off of the market uh, for use for Airbnbs and houses that are second homes, like for instance, there's a lot of second homes in, 
in San Diego, especially along the coastal areas, we probably have 100,000 units of, of, of backlog that we could absorb immediately if they were just, just built. But they're not getting built, and so there's some kind of reason that they're not getting built. Um, you know, you have state and legislation that requires us now to reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled uh, that we have uh, that we do um, each and every day. And the really the only way to do that is is to is to either have people not travel to work or to locate people closer to work. So, so some of the some of the solutions that are starting to come out are to build more dense housing. So so densification of housing around where the current employment centers really are. Um, but then you look at the cost of housing, you know, somewhere up to 45% of the cost of a housing unit is really in, in fees and, and, and government imposed um, costs, which makes it very difficult to build those affordable units. But when you, when you talk about the solution, either we need to move the jobs closer to the, 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 jobs closer to the housing units, which, which doesn't work, or you can move the housing units closer to the jobs, which is densification, or we have to create a public transportation system, which is a lot of what Sandag works on, to get people out of their automobiles and get them to work effectively. Some of the things that are happening in San Diego to, to address that is um, changes in zoning that are going to allow for much denser populations, especially around mobility centers, but from the general plans, when you take a look at San Diego, you have uh, you see things like uh, areas like downtown San Diego adding tens of thousands of, of housing units. You have the sports arena area, which right now is is, is very low use in terms of, of housing, adding somewhere around thirty to forty thousand housing units. Mission Valley adds another thirty thousand. Kearney Mesa adds housing units, and those are really um, located strategically around where the, the existing job centers are and also around where some of the public transportation is. So those are some of the solutions that are in, in, in the works. But, but really, at the end of the day, it really is supply. We need to be building housing units like we used to build when we were able to do greenfield development, which is not something that we can do anymore. And, and I just want to echo you know, Everybody I, wanted to get in on <laughs> this one. So. I, I just want to echo what Ray is saying here, because I think this is really important for the region as a whole. We have, we have a bit of a moment right now in San Diego where you have all these massive projects taking place sort of on the same time frame, right? They're, it's all going through this planning process at the moment, but we have a lot of massive development and redevelopment taking place across the region. Simultaneously, there's a bold and aggressive uh, vision for connecting all of those nodes and hubs in in the region via mass transit. And I think this is important because if we're going to deal with our affordability challenges, we do need to increase the supply of housing and we need to make sure that the, the those housing units are accessible to workers and that people have other options to get around to and from work be it beyond their own vehicle. So I think I think this is a really exciting time for the region and it's a it's a critical time for the region and making sure that these projects are sort of executed to their best potential use and are connected and coordinated is is very important. And I just think the other element that Ray mentioned briefly that we need to consider is one of the solutions is having people not commute to work, which has an interesting impact because not only does it potentially redu reduce commute times locally, but it also opens up our labor force to more supply from literally anywhere. Um, and what does that mean? There are positives and negatives that come from that, but it's something that can help our economy to continue to grow if we can access this labor force, if we can let go in some scenarios of people needing to be face-to-face -face in an office all the time in order to get work done. I think the, uh, the, this also helps on the uh, child care front as well, both in, the, both in the sense of just having a little bit more logistical freedom to deal with the, so much of my life is the, you know, my wife and I high five in the driveway kind of thing to make sure that the kids are getting all the places they need to be uh, as well. Uh, so. Um, yeah, and when you talk about the, the child care element, it also goes back to employers being able to be flexible with hours when they can, and when they're not, being able to have stable and predictable hours for workers so that they can schedule their lives, their child care, around when they need to work in a way that's going to allow them, again, to participate in the labor force most fully. Um. I'm curious, uh, maybe Eduardo, if you want to talk about the, uh, the sort of the transportation piece that we sort of rubbed up against briefly, but went more in the direction of housing, because I know that's something that's. Uh... I mean, I can tell you personally, I'm I'm a transit rider, and so getting to and from work downtown is not that big of a deal. That's pretty easy. Getting out here is a little harder. 
Um, and, and it's because we don't have quite that, that network that, that really allows people to get to and from where they're going in a, in a timely fashion. And so making sure that the transportation system is competitive with owning and driving your own vehicle is key. And, and I think there's a lot of good ideas that are being floated in terms of how to, how to create that, that system and that network. Um, and it, and it's, it's critical because a lot of people are spending not just a lot of time, but a lot of money on transportation each year. The average household in San Diego spends about $14,000 a year on transportation alone. So that's eating into some of the other activities that obviously people could be spending that money towards, uh, maybe you know contributing to their ability to own a home here in the region where it is expensive to live. So it, it's a critical issue. It's one that impacts the workforce in a lot of different ways, and it's one that impacts employers in a lot of different ways in terms of having uh, their their workers come in in a timely manner and have and you know having lack of flexibility in terms of how they do get to and from work and when they can get to and from work. Uh, it's a critical issue and one that I think we all should be paying attention to. So let me ask the audience a question. How many people drove here today in a car? How many people took public transportation? Okay, public transportation doesn't work as an alternative to the automobile right now in San Diego. Um, I'm not, that's not saying that public transportation is not good, but the way that it's implemented right now isn't working um, to solve the problem. And you know, one of the things that, that we're doing at San Diego is taking a look not only at the existing public transportation system, but we're taking a look at empirically driven results from data to really understand how people travel around the region to design what will be the transportation system of the future. And so, you know, really a, a lot of the solution to the problem that Eduardo's mentioning is, is, is to be able to, to connect people to their jobs. And to do that, Sandag's developed these five strategies, and I won't get into all of them right now, but they're all part of what is right now called the five big moves. Um, and the only reason I put that out there is that on March 26, we will be presenting the, um, the plan in terms of, of what that might look like for the, for the region. But really, it, it solves the problem fundamentally from a different way, and it connects workers to uh, the places that they, um, where they live and where they work, and trying to, to make that final connection. Okay, so I want to turn still sort of in the, uh, the housing genre, but a little more specifically, you know, we've heard several things uh, over the course of the day so far about how tax incentives give uh, municipalities a uh, big incentive to uh, basically try to get a uh, new car lot on their, uh, in their jurisdiction, or at least uh, business more specifically. You know, we also heard that uh, a lot of uh, the fixed costs of building tends to skew uh, what new housing supply there is in a direction that's uh, targeted at the uh, upper end of the income distribution. So I think there's kind of two pieces of this that we got several questions uh, about, and I'd like to kind of, you know, we're going to hit both of them, so take whichever one you want first. Uh, kind of that notion of how do we, uh, how, how can we uh, fix the system a bit to generate uh, housing that is more targeted towards, you know, the, this issue of workforce housing, more the middle of the income distribution. So that's kind of the first big question. And then the second one is, um, you know, homelessness. The homeless crisis here in San Diego has been, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, the current discussion, uh, both in the news and just in policy circles. Um, you know, what can we do to specifically target housing supply that's going to help uh, address that issue? I mean... I hear that and I go back again to supply, supply, supply. Mm -hmm. If there is more supply of any type of housing, it's going to help affordability for everyone. So I think that's mm -hmm. one thing that's really important to keep in mind. Yeah, but in order to fix the supply, the thing is that you know, the, the government doesn't build housing. The, the government creates rules to keep housing from being built, is yeah. it, you know, essentially what happens. Um, you didn't hear me say that. Um, <laughs> What, what we need to do is somehow help the developers have a um, have, have certainty when it comes to uh, starting a project and being able to take it to fruition. Because right now, the way that the rules and regulations are set up, uh, there's a lot of risk involved in, in doing these housing projects. So if you want to lower the price of housing, in, in many cases, you need to somehow incentivize the private industry to be, be able to mm -hmm. do that. So I'm not saying that we should do that without any type of, of, of regulation, but I think that streamlining that process and, and, and making it uh, more certain for a developer so that they, they, can, they can have reasonable margins without having to go um, e extreme to try to make up for the times that they, they aren't able to to have a project come to fruition makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I think I think they both hit it on on the head. 
I won't be, claim to be an expert in this space, but my understanding is that currently, based on the the not just the regulations, but the cost actually associated with building, is it's really squeezing builders' ability to build that housing that would fall into the sort of middle of our income spectrum here in San Diego. So it's it's easy easier to build um, you know market rate housing that that very few people can afford. And it's easier to build subsidized housing because there's a subsidy to help deliver that, those units. But everything in between is really where developers are feeling the pinch and, and unable to kind of uh, make projects pencil out from what my understanding. It's simply not profitable to build housing that is affordable. The $2 million condo in downtown is a project that a developer could make money on, but the people who work downtown really can't afford to live there. And so what you end up having is it's interesting, too, because we build these uh, communities thinking that if we build housing in downtown, we'll have workers who live in downtown being able to live downtown and shorten the commute. And what we've created is actually a reverse commute to Serrano Valley, where the high-paying jobs are, because they're the only people who can afford the housing that's being built in downtown. So. It is an irony that one of the most popular, you know, so your average uh, starting assistant professor here uh, in, our, in our business school might be 27 or so. Um, you know, maybe not quite to kids yet, but thinking about it maybe five years from now, uh, they all want to live downtown, right? They, they like that lifestyle, but it is the reverse commute, and then they start to ask about transit, and we say, well, you can probably get to the mall, and then Uber from there with a bike or whatever. So it is, um, yeah, I, I think it's got some, you know, when, when we play the game of the jobs are here, let's put the housing here, we often get a lot of the unintended consequences because at the end of the day, these are all individual people who are making the, you know, my housing decision is a function of where's my job, where's the kind of house that my family wants, and then there's also issues like where, what kind of, uh, what kind of schooling are we going to have? I'm thinking about for for my kids, you know. I mean, our our decision to live up uh, in Penasquitos is in large part driven by I want to be as close to USD as I can, but I kind of want to be in Poway Unified too. And you start to look at the map and you draw a circle, and there we are. Yeah, I, I, actually, I think that that's, that's a very good observation because um, an urban lifestyle is not for everybody. You know, people, people choose to live where they live because of things like uh, the, the neighborhood that they're in, uh, the friends that they have, the, the school districts that the kids are in, the type of activities they, they like to do. And that's why you see the dominated, uh, you know, a younger population dominating downtown right now. Um, people don't necessarily move to where their jobs are because the housing units aren't necessarily of the right type either. So, good observation. Sorry, I'm just checking on the uh, the, the queue of uh, questions we've got here. Um, all right, so we got a couple questions um, that are all. Some, some are very general and some are very specific. Some are like referencing things we said a year ago along those sorts of lines. So, um, you know, we've been talking about the big picture and sort of the, uh, the medium term outlook for San Diego for a little while. But uh, I'm wondering, you know, maybe start with you on this, Ray. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on uh, kind of what the more near term outlook is? You know, do you have the uh, uh, everything's great and we have to shed our miserableism? You know, are you worried a little more about the inverted yield curve? Kind of where's, what's your thinking and what are you uh, what, what, at Sandag kind of thinking about what the outlook looks like for the next two years? It, so you're asking, is my crystal ball foggier than, than Dr. Thurnberg's <laughs> crystal ball? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, right now, if you look at the fundamentals of the economy, they're really, I, I don't see any reason that we would necessarily go into a recession anytime soon. However, with, with that said, um, I have started to present a recession scenario to our board of directors just to let them know if it comes, what it might look like, because we've now been in an expansion so long that they've forgotten what, what a downturn would, would really look like. So, so that, that's something that I'm doing uh, from a, a conservative perspective. I think you know, if there is going to be a slowdown um, in the next couple of years, it would be caused by one of those external shocks that, that we don't know what it is. I mean, the coronavirus could very well be something like that. It, it, it's, it's always been a shock the last time it was the housing crisis. This time, it could be something. I mean, it, 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 it's, I don't believe all the news that's coming out of China right now in terms of, of how bad or, or, or this is or isn't, but you could have global ramifications to that that could then impact the U.S. economy and, and, and force us into a downturn. But the, the fundamentals aren't there to put us into a recession. Um, a war would do it, you know, those, those type of things. Mm -hmm. 
I think I think the tight labor market is kind of going to persist in, in in the near term, and it's, it's obviously the biggest concern we have is is employers being able to find the talent that they need in a timely basis to to continue to produce the way that they have been for the last several years. So that that I think is is really the nearest term headwind that that we see right now is is the tight labor force and the tight labor market, and how do we get more people trained up, skilled up, relocated to San Diego to fill these jobs. And part of that is how do we help employers to provide training opportunities themselves, especially where we have a county where 95% of businesses have fewer than 50 employees. They don't necessarily have the scale to provide those opportunities. So how do we find collaborative solutions to train up talent? And how do we help employers to be uh, more aware of the skills that are needed for a job? And when they're creating a job posting, making sure that a bachelor's degree isn't being used as a signifier of skills that someone else may have, right? Not limiting the talent pool themselves when they could be more open to other sets of skills and credentials. So one of the things that's on our mind here uh, at USD a little bit, we know San Diego is a small business economy. We know San Diego is also a very entrepreneurial economy. And we have a lot of hope here that this is one of the big, um, you know, the American dream story of when we look at uh, you know, growing Hispanic Latino population, that this is really one of the engines of growth that can kind of really be the broad-based, you know, this isn't just the, uh, I went to the right schools, I work at the right company because somebody I know works at the right company, the entrepreneurship and kind of that individual, uh, you know, make your own opportunity is really a, uh, you know, one of the things we look at very hopefully. But we also know that this is the, uh, I have such a hard time with, uh, you know, I have to be an accountant, I have to be a leader, I have to be an HR person, I have to be a finance person all at the same time. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, this is for everybody, but I think, uh, you know, more Sarah and Eduardo, uh, what can we do better to support that? You know, what is, it, what is it that you're hearing that these small businesses most need help with? And, you know, what are we doing or what can we do better uh, to support that? So uh, we, we've surveyed and talked to lots of small businesses in, in the last couple of years uh, very extensively. The number one issue that a small business owner is always going to report is finding that next customer. Where is that next source of revenue going to be? So better, better connecting small businesses to their potential customers is really something that we're trying to focus in on. One thing that we're looking at in partnership with USD, in fact, is... Um, leveraging anchor institutions in the region to better articulate and communicate what their purchasing and procurement needs really are. So what, you know, what are you buying as an institution? What types of goods and services are you buying? How much are you spending on these things? And how much of that is being serviced here locally by, by small businesses? And then identifying if, there are, if we have capacity here in the region to meet that demand uh, by local small businesses. So that, that's, what, that's one big thing. Um, and then, you know, on the startup side and the new venture side, uh, capital, access to capital is always a challenge. And, you know, we have good numbers to suggest that venture capital is flowing into the region and, and it's doing well. Most of that's going to the biotech space and to the uh, precision health space. But um, it's still a need. It's still an ongoing need. It's still an ongoing challenge. One interesting idea uh, that I recently heard is kind of leveraging opportunity zones as a potential way to capitalize small businesses and startups in the region because there's uh, provisions that, that allow for that. So th there's a lot of um, new thinking that I think that's starting to emerge in terms of how we can support startups and small businesses in the region. Um, and it's critical because, uh, as Sarah mentioned, they, they make up the bulk of our firms in the region and they collectively employ more than half of our workforce. So it's critical to, to the San Diego region. And on the workforce side, small businesses are much more hesitant to take on workers that they aren't 100% sure are up to par or what they need for their business. There's a lot more risk associated with that, and a small business or a new business can't necessarily absorb that risk. So how can we, as other institutions, help to subsidize wages of um, of more risky hires in order to, number one, get those people opportunities, get them in the door, and number two, help those newer businesses who can absorb the risk always of hiring the, the uh, workforce that they need. So I've got a couple questions here in the, uh, in the queue, the uh, official San Diego County Economic Roundtable burner phone here. So please, if you have a question that you've heard, feel free to hit us up here. Um, that are all related to various things kind of coming out of Sacramento. So on one hand, we have kind of the uh, what, uh, what do you expect 
uh, to see happen in the next year or two, just around kind of regulations around the gig economy and uh, uh, how we're treating the 1099 workers. Um, also, uh, a bit of the uh, you know the juxtaposition that Chris was showing us of. We had lots of good ideas on housing at the state level, and then something seemed to happen. So I'm just curious, sort of, you know, let's, let's make this as broad as possible, I guess, if you want to take one of those specifically or just more generally. Uh, you know, California has a very unique kind of local control, but yet it's all run from Sacramento anyway. Um, so just kind of the interaction of what you see going on in Sacramento and how you think that's going to affect uh, what, what your particular portfolio is. Well, so I'll take the, the, the housing question just because we've been working on that a little bit um, during this conversation. Um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the state laws are having more teeth to them now than they used to when it came to housing. So in the past, we would get recommendations in terms of how much housing we should be building, and now they're becoming um, more uh, dictates in terms of, of how much housing we need to build and they're, they're putting kind of teeth to it with the laws. And so what you're seeing is a lot of the, 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 the local communities, I think every one of the local jurisdictions uh, in San Diego understands that housing is a problem, and um, they have all received housing goals from the state of California. It's, called, it's part of the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, or RENA, as it's, it's known for short. And so each one of the jurisdictions has a goal in terms of how much housing they're supposed to build. So that, that's, you know, those type of laws are now coming down from Sacramento, and it's, it, is, it is impacting, um, for instance, the um, land use zoning, for instance, and, and where, you, where you can and where is, you'll see a lot more densification around mobility hubs or around transit stations and, and around public transportation, and, and, and that's, that's the direction it's going. So, I mean, long term, I mean, that's what I, I, I see happening. There's, there's less housing units that are being allowed to be built in uh, the more urban or, or uh, sorry, suburban areas or the, the county areas. Um, you, you even see measures on the, on the ballot uh, to keep that from happening, uh, you know, even, even more. So I think when you look at this long term, what you, what you end up seeing is that most of the growth in the next uh, foreseeable future, like through 2050, is all going to happen in what is right now the existing urbanized area. And, and it's and it's all going to be it's it, it's all state laws that are that are that are being uh, written that are that are kind of helping to guide that process happen. So is is the uh, I guess the subtext of your answer that you expect to see the state knocking heads together a little more? Where you know I think the model up until now has been we establish a goal that's based on a model and a forecast and what we would like to see happen, and then there's a lot of court battles and whatnot around compliance with it, but the state has largely just sort of clucked a little bit up until now? Are you expecting to see them get a little more uh, aggressive on making compliance happen? It, it seems like the winds are going towards more compliance. And it, you know, you, there, there are other laws too, like for instance, um, goals that, are, that, that we need to meet in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, goals in terms of, of reduction in vehicle miles traveled. Those kind of goals for, for us to be able to reach that from a transportation planning perspective requires us to either change our land use patterns, meaning move the houses closer to the jobs, or to do something with, with, with transit that has never been seen before. So, so you know, that's, that's part of what we're working on is, is that plan, but, but as the state continues to regulate those type of, of um, the, the effects of, of, of living far away, like for instance, the Inland Empire used to be, or, or at least Temecula Riverside used to be um, kind of the, the outlet for some of San Diego employment too. It's like people would move up there and they would drive down the 15. You know, it's making it more difficult for us to, to, to do that. The state laws now require us to take care of our own housing growth, whereas in the past, we could use that as a relief valve. We can't do that anymore, so yes. I see it becoming more stringent. Okay, so that was definitely the uh, the housing piece, but I want to kind of get your thoughts just generally. Like I say, what are you thinking about on a daily basis, and kind of where is what's going on in Sacramento showing up in your uh, portfolio? What we're seeing a lot coming down from um, the Employment Development Department, which is the the hub of Sacramento that really looks at workforce and and our boards, are a lot of efforts to incentivize employers to improve job quality and to look at what are the even low-hanging fruit opportunities that we have in order to enhance a person's 
um, work life. So part of that is reinforcing the parts of this that it's not altruism. If you have higher job quality, you are increasing your retention, you're decreasing turnover, those are the same thing. Um, but we also see in um, the state government some leanings toward things like stable scheduling policies. There was something on the floor this past year that didn't come through, but laws to make it make mandatory um, limits on perhaps how far in advance you provide schedules to workers, um, how, how much of a predictable schedule you have to give them upon hiring. So that didn't go anywhere this year, but that could be coming back around. It's something that is really important for businesses to be actively involved in making legislation like that um, so that it is going to be in the best interest of both businesses and workers. Yeah, um, a couple things. So one, there, there's a lot of discussion around the establishment of a statewide trade office. Um, I think it's still very early days, but it's it's an important thing for California as a state to be paying attention to. Obviously, one of the largest economies in the world uh, as a state by itself and uh, very international in nature in terms of what we produce and sell um, outside of uh, the state of California. Um, on the gig worker side, and I'm forgetting the name of the of the the bill itself, um, but I know it's still early days, and so we don't have a lot of data to really dig into this. But we've received some anecdotal information from employers and organizations that have traditionally relied on contract workers, um, you know, uh, with, with flexible work schedules. That they're having to be very creative about how they continue to employ those people going forward. So the the new regulations are really hitting them in a way that. Um, they were unprepared for. And so whether that means these contract workers uh, have to become full-time employees or if they have to estab establish um, uh, business licenses themselves so that they're doing a business-to-business -business contract relationship rather than a contract working relationship, all of these things are being explored and evaluated. Um, and in the near term, I think it's creating a lot of uncertainty and probably causing a lot of pause in terms of some of the economic activity. I know that that's something that uh, is not necessarily considered a... Um, uh, a done deal in terms of how this legislation might evolve uh, in the near future, but it's certainly something that we're starting to hear some grumblings about. Uh, what would be on your wish list, I guess, in the sense that, you know, a lot of times we talk about Sacramento as something that crashes down in our lap, you know, a big unfunded mandate or a one-size-fits-all policy. Uh, you know, let's put on our, uh, what, would, what would we, what can they do to break some of the log jams that you're most concerned about? If we're talking about housing development, we're talking about transportation, we're talking about uh, workforce, job growth, getting people moving back to California instead of moving away, um, you know, go big. Here's a megaphone. We can shout their direction for a change. I'll go back to childcare for now. One thing that can come from Sacramento is incentivizing um, businesses or cities to provide childcare, and whether that's paying for it, state-funded childcare, um, or whether it's just creating business incentives or even workforce incentives. Childcare workers make minimum wage or less, um, which, how does that happen? I don't know, but that's what the data says. Um, so if we want high quality child care, how do we produce it? And how do we produce the labor force that we need in order to ensure that the very beginning of our workforce pipeline is well cared for and is moving in the right direction? Well, <clears throat> I, I would like to see them maybe take some of the surplus that they currently have and invest it into those type of projects that um, they feel would be the most beneficial in the region, whether they were housing or transportation projects, but have the money come back uh, to the local governments to to really implement some of the the intent of some of the the, the legislation that's being passed. Yeah, I, I double down on public transit, and I have very personal reasons for that. But also, I think it's an important investment that, uh, so far at least, as a region by ourselves, we we have not completely solved that problem. And so, how do we get additional resources, additional funding, additional support to really implement some of these grand visions that we're starting to build? 
Got a couple of questions that have come in on the transit front, specifically I think some of, uh, some of my North County people here saying that transit always seems to be something that is really uh, about connecting downtown to maybe Mission Valley. So I guess, uh, you know, think a little bigger. Are, are, are we thinking that the vision needs to be that we're gonna connect transit all the way up to Escondido? Uh, maybe at the expense of you know carpool lanes and these sorts of things. Kind of what's what's the what's what's the mix on that that you think is the best approach for uh, you know transit where where we have density, but also maybe you know what's going on in the other half of the county that's a little less dense. It, it's a great question because historically the planning that has been done in the region really was very downtown centric. And then when you take a look at downtown, downtown's not even our largest employment center. It's mm -hmm. it's third right now. And it's a distant third. Serrano Valley, Kearney Mace are both larger employment centers than that. But specifically to North County, and this is where empirical data and just objectively looking at it makes such a difference. This is the first time we've used this type of data when we've developed this plan. But you take a look at North County and the commuting patterns of people in North County, where they live and where they work, is completely different than the commuting patterns of people who, live, who work in Serrano Valley, for instance. Serrano Valley draws people from the entire San Diego region about half of the workers in the North County work around the employment centers that are in North County. So a public transportation system that would work for North County would have to connect the job centers in North County to the North County, uh, to the people who live in North County. And so uh, when we take a look at this, you know, we, the 78 is the major corridor through there that you've got the Sprinter, which is a, a train line that doesn't really go through any of the, the major job centers. And so rethinking it and saying, well, where are the jobs? Because a lot of the, the, the Palomar Airport Road area is also built up recently. So what you do is you, you rethink that and, and, and create a complete corridor around the job centers in North County. And then you augment that with public transportation. And then you augment it with things like autonomous, flexible fleets in the future where, where people could take care of that last mile problem and getting to their home. When we take a look at this, we could, we can, right now we're offering very little in terms of public transportation to North County, but with a, a system that actually took into account the data, we could probably offer 80% of the people in the region an alternative. That doesn't mean everybody has to take it, but that there really would be a, a true alternative that would be as competitive as the automobile, uh, that would be priced about the same, um, that, that people could take, and thereby relieving some of the traffic. But it really has to do with rethinking the transportation system and rethinking how people are traveling throughout the region and not making it downtown-centric. Ray, one of the things that I think about in our transportation challenges are really that density question, right? I lived in New York City for 10 years, and there, you don't need a car. You can get anywhere you need to go, to work, to the grocery store, to wherever you need to be. Um, and you don't need an automobile. Here, if you need to go to work and then you need to go to soccer practice, or you need to pick someone up from daycare, do you think that the public transportation solutions we're coming up with are going to be able to meet those needs as well? Do you think that's possible in an area, a region like ours? Yeah, so, you know, I don't, I don't see a, a bus connecting everybody to everywhere. That's not what a public transportation system is. You have to think about it differently. You think about taking technology and using technology to uh, as, a, as an enabler to help solve that last mile problem, which is what really you're talking about are sh these short local trips. So just imagine, and the technology exists now if you take what Uber's doing and what some other people are doing, but just imagine if, if you were able to, on your phone at any time you wanted to, call an autonomous vehicle that would come and pick you up and take you to soccer practice, drop you off, and then it would go take somebody else somewhere else, and when you needed it, it would be back there for you. That, that, that's not that far away. When we're talking about planning for, for 30, 40, 50, or 100 years of transportation, you take a look at that type of technology, and it really starts to solve the last mile problem. And I think that's something that in any previous transportation plan, we couldn't solve. And so you always had like, a, if you're not within a quarter mile of a transit station, you weren't able to use public transportation. But now, two or three miles in, in an autonomous vehicle like this would, would potentially allow allow the vast majority of the region to actually be able to, to utilize the, the rest of those lines that would be taking you to the further places. And we will never have the density that we have in New York. Hopefully we never have that type of density. Um, but with that said, we really need to rethink land use too and to start thinking about densifying around some of these transportation infrastructure uh, investments that we would be making in the future. 
A uh, couple questions here related to, um, I guess, two different sides of the same uh, coin. So one of them, uh, more on the population side, just kind of the, uh, you know, want to hear generally about the, uh, you know, this idea that net domestic migration from San Diego seems to be negative for a long time. Uh, so kind of what impact do you think that has on the workforce, on many of the housing projections and, and whatnot that we're going to make? And then in a similar vein, um, you know, we hear a lot uh, about kind of business climate and sort of what the business version of that is, that the, uh, the oppressive hand of California regulations also driving a lot of businesses out, which I think is kind of an overdone motif occasionally, but I uh, want to get your thoughts on both of those. So you want to go the domestic migration and population route, you want to go business climate route, but we got a lot we can do with that too. Yeah, I think the domestic migration issue is a real one that we're facing. Um, <coughs> I think we need to rethink our vignette of millennials as these kids who are kicking and streaming into the workforce. Millennials are in their 30s and they have children and they want to buy houses um, and they want to settle down. And these are the people who I'm seeing leaving, and they're the people who we need to be moving up in the workforce to be taking on the leadership roles that are going to be vacated by the baby boomers, but we're hollowing out the center of our workforce because I'm, I know people have moved to St. Louis, people have moved to Austin, people have moved to Denver, all of these hubs where they're still vibrant cities and they're affordable. Um, so I think it really goes back to housing as a, a big driver of a lot of those moves that I'm seeing. Um, and I think it's, it's a real problem for our economy. In, in terms of population, it's interesting because um, up until just recently, we've been forecasting a population of 4 million here by, by 2050. Those numbers come from the Department of Finance and uh, earlier this or last month, they, they came up with a revised number for San Diego of 3.7 million. So it's a significant drop in, in, in the growth rate um, based upon a couple of things. One is the migration and one is uh, fertility rates are also reducing. So, I mean, it, it, what it does is it slows down the growth in San Diego. It doesn't bring it to a stop completely. So the, the long-term projections are still that, that we're, we're growing. We're, we will still be, be adding population, but not at the, at the rates that we thought we were going to. And if you go back to 2008, they thought the population was going to be 4.5 million. So, you know, I mean, all forecasts are wrong. Some are useful. This one. Um, the, in, in terms of... of, of out migration, I think you know a lot of it has to do with, with job creation too. And San Diego, with the biotech that is occurring and the spinoffs that are occurring from UCSD, really is a hotbed for a couple of things. And one is the venture capital coming in, and these companies are going to continue to create jobs and it's going to continue to create demand and to bring that that high. Uh, quality talent into the region. I know it, it fundamentally changes the type of workforce we have here in San Diego, which is why a lot of people are, you know, it's like we're, we're the, the, the middle jobs. I mean, they're, they're going away, I agree with you, but what's happening is that it's, we're turning into a much more uh, high-tech focused uh, um, hub over here in, in, in San Diego. Yeah, and, and and I think I agree. I think the 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 demographic and migration challenge is the real one here. If if we're if we're being honest, and it goes back, everything goes back to workforce. Really, it's it's how do we make sure that we have the workforce to fill those jobs of today and tomorrow? And and to Sarah's point, I I, I think that's exactly right in terms of the, the millennial cohort. Uh, not they are, but we are the um, uh, you know in prime working age and and at at that point in our in our you know, respective lives and careers where all that settling down um, should theoretically be taking place. All of those decisions have been delayed by this generation um, in large part because of, of the impact of the Great Recession. But as, as, this, as our cohort comes to that age and starts to make, prepare to make those decisions, one of the principal things is can we buy a home and settle down and, and you know, really set roots in, in whatever market that we're living in. And I know personally from a lot of people that uh, are also millennials um, that that decision is increasingly difficult and one that um, people are, are willing to consider relocating out of, out of region, out of state, um, because the cost of living pressures are a real consideration. And so I think solving that issue is, is key to make sh making sure we retain the existing workforce that we have and that, and that those um, younger workers are able to kind of age and, and grow into that next uh, tier of, 
of, of employment, um, and, and then that and that that will, will kind of continue to maintain that pipeline of new of new workforce and new development and new talent here in the region. I think that's instrumental. Yeah, and I think the trade off is something to keep in mind as well between where you want to live and where you can live. And there are places in this country where you can live in the place where you want to live and you can afford it. And you don't have to be halfway to Palm Springs before you can afford a house um, to be able to live. My sort of interesting micro metric on this is not, I mean, I look at the Department of Finance numbers and all that as well, but uh, uh, just keeping an eye on our recent graduates, you know, I mean, I've been here at USD about 11 years and, you know, the initial kind of coming out of the Great Recession, San Francisco was kind of the big metro that was a huge consumer of, uh, of our graduates. It was almost uniform that all of our talented people were like, I would love to stay in San Diego, but I can't find a job. That's the main thing. There's not a job that really is kind of commensurate with the, with the skills. and whatnot. So there was this huge kind of brain drain up to San Francisco for a while. I would say that reversed maybe uh, in 15 or 16. But what I, the funny thing I'm seeing now is the... Uh, the San, and this is funny because this kind of mirrors my own life. I was in the Bay Area for a while, you know, in, in my 20s and the, in early 30s, and then uh, kind of like, I actually want to come back, you know, where do I want to live now? Now I've got a little bit bigger choice set, and so I feel like the decisions I'm hearing from these, uh, from these you know, 10 years out uh, alums are along the lines of, I really want to get back to San Diego. And one of them said something very interesting to me, which was that, but it feels like Santa Barbara a little bit which is the, if you've made a lot of money elsewhere, it's a great place to live, but you're not gonna go there to kind of start off your life. So, um, you know, I think a lot of what we've hit on today is the, the notion that we kind of see a road where we become that, the, the sleepy, not very thriving place where lots of rich people who made their money elsewhere live. Um, so uh, we're, we're here in the home stretch now, just about five more minutes. I think I've uh, blown through most of the questions or at least something uh, near. Uh, if you've got any last ones, I'm happy to take them here. But uh, I think just sort of, you know, last thoughts, take this in whatever direction you want to of, of what you've heard today and you're thinking about San Diego, uh, you know, in, in both the next two years, the short term outlook, but the longer term outlook, uh, you know, what are, what, what are you, uh, what do you most want to leave the audience with? Well, I, actually, I'm, I'm much more optimistic about San Diego and San Diego's future and the fundamentals here in terms of the, the type of, of, of jobs that are being created than um, I, I think may, may have come across during this, this discussion. I, I really do think that when you take a look at things like cybersecurity and you take a look at what's happening in, in software and biotech, those, those are really the industries that are going to be driving the economy for the next 50 years. And those are all... Uh, areas where San Diego is really has a leadership position, and so if we use that as a strength, then I think that um, you know we will continue to be a thriving, uh, a thriving community. It's like yes, do we have a housing issue? Absolutely. So does the you know the rest of the state of California. If if we solve that, you know, will people start coming back? Do they have to move away? If if we can we can solve that problem. So I think you know we solve some of the fundamental problems. And um, this has always been a wonderful place to live. And you know, Navy's pivoting here. Even even more high tech jobs that are associated with Navy are coming here. I, I think San Diego has a bright future. So, yeah, I, I mean, it, 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 maybe the conversation did feel a little bit um, dire at times. But I think overall, San Diego is well positioned, and we we've been a very strong regional economy for the last ten plus years. And and uh, I think that's going to continue to be the case. The the Talent has always been the secret sauce of what makes San Diego a successful regional economy. So making sure that we unlock that talent that's already here and continue to draw that high quality talent that uh, has historically come to the region is gonna be key. Um, and to Ray's point, the, the industries that are kind of leading the growth, the economic growth and the charge here in San Diego are high tech, high skilled, uh, employing uh, industries and are going to, for the foreseeable future, require advanced education, whether that's a two, four, or plus year degree. And so making sure that we're connecting people to, to that training and to those opportunities is gonna be absolutely instrumental. A lot of my takeaways are similar to Eduardo's, really focusing on that, that workforce development aspect. Um, but I would say I am a little bit scared for San Diego's future, not for the city as a whole. I have every confidence that it will be a thriving economy and a beautiful place to live forever. But in what it could become and the vitality that 
could be lost if we don't unlock the labor force that's here and connect everybody to the opportunities that are going to be available and created by these economies. Um, I, could very well become that sleepy place where people come to live and, and doesn't have a vibrant and growing economy. So I would just keep our, our goggles on um, and focus on that. Yeah, I mean, for me, from, from what I heard, and I think my own take on this is just that, you know, we've got the secret sauce. We've got a lot of things that are uh, fundamentals that we have that lots of other, uh, you know, metros would, uh, would would be very envious of. And in some sense, a lot of our issue is just let's get out of our own way. Let's get some of these roadblocks out of the way that can really let um, that our uh, growth uh, unleash. Okay, so I think uh, I want to uh, thank all of our panelists here, and in general, on behalf of USD and the School of Business. Uh, so please, yes, you deserve it.